Let's go out. Hello there. Are you are you from DCMS or Cabinet Office?
lovely Hannah. Do us a favor. Tell us to move that monitor. Move that monitor. Oh, look, look, he's doing it. It's like when we do it. Yeah, we shall. <laughs> so you know what to do, you see. If you're young, you know how to, how to pose. And you must have a TikTok account. I don't post for it. You have got one. I've got a 
Good morning. Please be considerate when using chairs and allow viewing space for others. Thank you for your assistance.
Well, he hello everyone, and thank you for joining us. It's me, Camilla Tomini, Associate Editor of The Telegraph, and I'm joined here by military historian Christopher Joll and my colleague on The Telegraph, Gordon Rayner, also Associate Editor, to just give you some commentary into the run-up to this momentous day, uh, 10 days in the making in the short term, but of course years in the planning. <laughs> and the scene that you're seeing here and the bell there tolling 96 times uh, once a minute for every 96 years that the Queen lived. And the scene there, of course, is Westminster Abbey, where guests have already started arriving for the state funeral. They've been coming from by bus, they've been coming on foot, they've been coming in since 8 a.m. Um, let me bring you in immediately, chaps. Um, just to explain context, Gordon, you covered the royals extensively for this newspaper, yep. didn't you, in the noughties and uh, <coughs> the tens? Yes, yes more the tens. <laughs> yeah. More the tens. And Christopher, your background, you were in the Household Cavalry, you I were a lifeguard since. for seven years and you served, was it four tours of Northern Ireland? Four, yes, I'm afraid so. So um, Christopher's here to talk us through the pomp and pageantry and we're all here just to discuss Obviously, what is a solemn day, but equally this global spectacle that's going to be watched by billions around the world. Now, these arrivals by buses, Gordon, have been a little controversial, although uh, New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinta Ardern yesterday said there shouldn't be any fuss about the bus. Yes. Who have we seen come in by bus so far? Well, uh, we saw the Middletons earlier on. Uh, they are really setting uh, an example for uh, the world leaders who perhaps were moaning a little bit about the idea of having to be bussed in. So the, uh, the parents of the future queen came by bus. Uh, we've also seen uh, members of the cabinet, including uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, coming in by bus. So they were arriving a good two hours uh, before the uh, ceremony is due to start. So we think that pretty much everyone uh, is going to be bussed in, apart from a select few. We know, obviously, uh, Joe Biden is going to be allowed to bring the beast. Um, we don't really know who else is going to be able to have their own transport, so that will be interesting to see who's managed to uh, make their case to have their own motorcade. Um, and Christopher, just as this event from a military perspective is planned with complete precision, there is also an order of precedence when it comes to arrivals. Yes, Do we is. think that in the Abbey, I mean, it seats 2,000, but priori priority seating will be given to the likes of Joe Biden, maybe the leaders of the Commonwealth realms? Are they in the good seats and then people who are perhaps <laughs> less important diplomatically are further back? Uh, yes, it will certainly be like that. Um, there is a, an established order of precedence for these kind of state occasions. And um, the protocol officers will all know who's sitting and where they're to sit. Yes, indeed. So, and indeed, foreign royals who are all coming in, they were all at that state reception, that extraordinary gathering of more than a thousand people. Uh, probably the biggest state reception that's been held this century. Let's just go through the timetable of what to expect now. It's coming up to 9.40. So in under an hour, we're going to see the bearer party found by the Queen's Company, 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards, lift the coffin from the catafalque in Westminster Hall and carry it to the north door. That's happening at around 10.35. I say around, Christopher. It will happen at 10.35. It will happen on the dock. <laughs> um, and then at that point, um, a, the state gun carriage, which of course has got huge historical significance. Gordon, did you write something on the 1901 connections to the gun carriage? It's been used by the Royal Navy for more than a century, hasn't it? And got yeah, huge it was, significance. That's right. It was retired uh, from the Royal Navy in 1901 to be used at the funeral of Queen Victoria. Um, and it's been used for the funerals of every monarch since then, apart from Edward VIII, I believe. Hugely significant. Christopher, this band? Uh, that's the um, mass bands of the Royal Marines. And we'll expect to see them all coming up. This is Whitehall. So they're going to be marching up, and this would be funereal music. I mean, it sounds yes. quite upbeat, <laughs> but actually it's the whole, the, all of the uh, order of service and, of course, the music played by these mass bands is going to be funereal. It's clearly not funereal at the moment. That's a listening to what's being played is a perfectly standard um, armed services march. Ah, OK. And they are marching at their normal pace rather than at the funeral pace of 75 uh, steps to the minute. And there's a difference, isn't there? When we see this procession later, which we'll get on to in just a moment, who's going to be in it, when we saw them in lockstep with the muffled drum being beaten, it's going to be the same thing as it we is. saw on Wednesday, effectively. Correct. Um, 
let's take you through the uh, schedule a little further. 10.44 a.m., the gun carriage will set off, drawn in spectacular style by 142 Royal Navy ratings. The route from New Palace Yard to Westminster Abbey will be lined with the Royal Navy and the Royal Mis Marines. The procession is going to be led by the massed pipes and drums of Scottish and Irish regiments, the Brigade of Gurkhas and the Royal Air Force, numbering 200 musicians, uh, which is astonishing in itself, Christopher. I mean, two... I'm, I'm amazed we still got that number. I know. <laughs> um, but also just with 10 days planning, I mean, they obviously always rehearse together. Um, W would this be something that they would just take in their stride and be able to perform? Well, each band obviously does its own rehearsals, but actually bringing them all together is quite something. Um, I read earlier that uh, the bands are all going to be playing the same music, um, so they'll have rehearsed that. But they won't be playing it at the same time, because in the procession from the Abbey to um, Wellington Arch, there are, in fact, I think seven bands. Uh, the, the procession itself is divided up by the bands. And they will all be playing the same music, but people standing in one particular spot won't hear the same music seven times over, if you see what I mean. Yes. Um, the gun carriage itself is going to come next, flanked by the bearer party comprising pallbearers from the service equerries to the Queen and detachments of the King's bodyguards of the Honourable Corps of Gentlemen at Arms, the Yeomen of the Guard and the Royal Company of Archers. Immediately behind the Queen's coffin will walk, of course, the Royal Mourners. At 10.52 a.m., the procession will arrive at the west gate of the Abbey. Of course, it's a short distance between Westminster yeah. Hall and Westminster Abbey. The bearer party will lift the coffin from the state gun carriage and carry it into the Abbey for the state funeral service to begin. Um, now, Gordon, um, the procession, from a royal perspective, of course, will be focused on uh, the military presence, but as is ever the case at a time like this, the focus is going to be on that royal procession. What can you tell me about that, Gordon? Yes, well, we've seen members of the royal family walking behind the coffin already several times uh, since the Queen's death, and we'll see that again today. Uh, we'll see the King uh, leading that, uh, that procession. We'll see the Princess Royal, uh, the only female member of the royal family who's included uh, in the procession. And, of course, we'll see the Duke of York uh, and the Earl of Wessex um, walking four abreast. And then behind them, uh, we will have the likes of the Prince, uh, the Prince of Wales, uh, his brother, the Duke of Sussex, uh, and uh, other less senior members of the royal family uh, walking behind them. Uh, I think when we get to the Abbey itself, uh, we will have, I think it's 18 members of the royal family uh, walking behind the coffin, including uh, Prince George and Princess Charlotte. Yes, and that's the first time we're really going to see them as part of this 10-day mourning period. And maybe that might divide opinion, you know, um, having children as young as nine and seven in this. Mm. But it's equally a sign of their public role to come, isn't it? This is part and parcel of what it is to be a royal. Even if you're a child, yeah. you have to be on display, Christopher. Well, I have a feeling that after the kerfuffle following uh, the funeral of Princess Diana, where it seems as though the two young princes at the time were told they had to be there, I'm absolutely certain that hasn't been repeated and that Prince George and Princess Sharp were asked if they would like to be there and if they said yes, then they, would, they were included. So I don't think there's any element this time around of any Being kind cajoled. of... Yeah, yeah. Also, it's a different circum set of circumstances. Um, when Diana, Princess of Wales, died, it was a tragedy, Gordon. She was 36, the whole... Mm country and the world was caught up in the shock of the event. Yeah. When a 96 year old dies who has lived a long and fulfilled life, it's a different kind of mourning. Um, William and Kate take um, a great deal of care to ensure that the children are included at appropriate moments. I mean, we remember from the Platinum Jubilee, they were last minute decision making because children don't always perform on ceremony, do <laughs> no, they? No, and I, we were led to believe that they spent an awful lot of time thinking about whether or not to bring their children. Uh, they're also going to, they think that they will um, attend the uh, committal later on at St George's Chapel, but that, they'll decide that later on depending on how the children are feeling. But it, I think there would have been a sense that um, it's, it's a hugely symbolic um, gesture uh, to have the, you know, the future king. George is now second in line to the throne. Uh, so to have him present at the funeral I think it, it's a way of projecting 
uh, the fact that the, the monarchy is a constant. Um, it's quite a sort of reassuring thing for people um, to see that, that, that you have uh, the whole future of the monarchy there in front of them. And it's a very, it's a very powerful image that that's going to send out to, to Britain and the world. And when it comes to these processions, there are two really. There's one, there's one, well, three actually. Three. One from Westminster Hall to Westminster Abbey. One down Westminster Abbey to the choir, as it is known, where the royals will be seated at the front. And then there's this procession, Christopher, from Westminster Abbey to Wellington Arch. Correct. Actually, before I come to you, Gordon, are the children taking part in that aspect, do we know? Uh, they will walk down the nave of Westminster Abbey. Um, uh, we think that they will be at the committal ceremony in Windsor, but we don't think that they will process uh, any further. Uh, but we don't know. We don't we, know. We it's still to, to be confirmed. Mm. But that moment, Christopher, because we keep on talking about the first state funeral since the Winston Churchill um, in the 1960s. Um, as far as the military planning for this is concerned, we were speaking about this a bit earlier. I mean, of course, the forces have 10, 20 years to plan for Operation London Bridge. Yeah. But at the same time, some of the soldiers that might have been involved 20 years ago aren't in <laughs> office anymore. Or the personnel changes. So how do the military, from a logistical perspective, plan for this? Um, the way that it's done is the units that are going to be involved are all predetermined. So they know who's, which units are going to be in the parade. They know where they're going to be in the parade. But what they don't know is who's going to be in command of those units and indeed who, who's going to be in the ranks. But that's where discipline and drill and training comes in. In a sense, it almost doesn't matter because they are well drilled, they are well disciplined. And if they know, all they need to know is you want to get from A to B. But what do you think is the um, hardest part? Who is playing the hardest part in all this? Because I think from people watching this live stream, as far as they're concerned, it's the pallbearers that are carrying this coffin. We have seen this absolutely sort of superb display of dignity and um, precision. But my understanding, and I spoke to an MP about it, Mike Penning, who used to be the Armed Forces Minister, he said some of the Grenadier Guards that conveyed the coffin into Westminster Hall were just out of training, yeah. that they were rookies, because yeah. they didn't have many medals on. Yeah. So you've got these young lads, have you, being told, look, this is your job now. How does that work for them? I, funnily enough, I think that is less of a challenge than, say, the job that um, the Garrison Sergeant Major, Vern Stokes, has. Because the ball bearers just have to learn the drill and they do their rehearsals with a coffin full of sand. They'll be, they'll be used to that and they'll only have to do it two, they will have done it two or three times before they had to do it for the very first time on parade. I'm just seeing these images who are, which are very familiar to us, um, Christopher, because we yeah. recognise these re uniforms. Yeoman of the Guard. Of course. And typically they would be based? Um, well, the Yeoman of the Guard um, doesn't exist as a permanent corps in the sense they're not in a barracks. They are all retired soldiers, sailors and airmen. Um, there are qualifications for being uh, a member of the Yeoman of the Guard. I think you have to have a long service and good conduct medal. There we have, um, I think, the Dean of Westminster on the left um, and another prelate uh, standing next to him. They're all obviously in mourning um, robes. Interesting, you don't often see those. Yeah, two clergymen, senior clergymen, um, Gordon, well, three, the Archbishop mm. of Canterbury, but also we've got the two Davids, so David Connor mm. and David Ho Hoyle uh, officiating. W let's talk about the order of service because it's mm. re reflecting, of course, um, the late Queen's uh, deep faith, a yes. deep Christian faith, a church going woman who took a coronation oath before God and. Mm. Um, you know, it was very God-fearing throughout her whole reign. Uh, but equally reflecting uh, some of the music that we heard at the coronation. Mm -hmm. So celebratory of a life as well as a, a service in remembrance, so to speak. Yes, uh, I thought it was fascinating that um, John Sentamu, the former Archbishop of York, um, said that the Queen didn't want a long, boring funeral service. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's sort of typical of her that, that she was thinking about other people. She could have um, been very indulgent and wanted something that went on for an hour and a half, two hours, but she 
uh, she was thinking about the people who were going to be attending, so she kept it. She's kept it to within the hour. Um, very traditional. Um, we've got uh, a lot of this sort of greatest hits really of um, of the Anglican Church. We've got the Lord's My Shepherd. Uh, we've got Love Divine or Love's Excelling. We'll hear that. Um, the readings. We'll have Baroness Scotland reading from Corinthians. Uh, oh, death, where is thy sting? Uh, Liz Truss will read from uh, the Gospel of St. John uh, when uh, Christ reassured um, his disciples at the Last Supper. The, in my house there are many mansions, people will recognize that. Um, but there'll also be a touching reference to Prince Philip later on at St. George's Chapel. Um, we'll hear the Contachion of the Departed, which is um, a hymn to the Orthodox Church, which was the religion that Philip was born into and it'll be sung to a Kiev melody um, at a time when <laughs> war is raging in Ukraine, of course. Uh, so very thoughtful, um, very traditional, a uh, little bit of modernity. Um, Judith Weir, the master of the Queen's music, has composed a new choral work, uh, which we'll hear later on, um, but very British as well. There'll be a lot of British music, Elgar, Vaughan Williams, Gibbons, um, and uh, of course, taking place in the uh, in the same place that she got married in 1947, um, where she was crowned in 1953, and where we've seen so many more weddings since then. Yeah, so many celebrations. I'll just go back to that reference to the Ukrainian capital because that must have been a late addition. It's worth stressing, isn't it? Lots has been said. Oh, she oversaw every single detail of this funeral, and I was told by somebody in the palace last week. Well, look, you know, she was. A, abreast of the ceremonial aspects yeah. but some of the logistics and some of the last minute changes and who for instance might accompany the coffin from Scotland to yeah. London which of course ended up being the Princess Royal you know the late okay. Queen would not have been aware of that sort of level of detail Christopher no she wouldn't have been and um, I think what she was saying is absolutely correct she had an overview and she will have expressed um, her views as to what should be included I would have thought the hymns are her personal choice, the readings are her personal choice. But, you know, even, even the monarch doesn't get to dot the I's and cross the T's on this kind of thing. There has to be flexibility. And I think one of the things that, that was really notable in this, Camilla, and you and I have discussed this before, is that um, Operation London Bridge provided that on day one, the sovereign's body would be returned to Buckingham Palace. That isn't what happened. No. Because she died in Scotland, which I believe was deliberate, um, because she died in Scotland, they decided to make the most of that. And the lying at rest, it wasn't a lying in state. The lying at rest of St Giles was added. That was not in London Bridge as it was drafted even as recently as two months ago. When you say deliberate, that the Queen would have been happy with the idea of being in Balmoral in her final hours and weeks? Well, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I think uh, the Queen knew that the end wasn't very far off, and I think she was determined to die at her favorite residence in Scotland. But of course, there are political implications to that as well. Mm. And it is possible, um, I may get beaten up for this, but it is possible that this was actually an overt decision on the part of the Queen, mm. as part of the whole constitutional debate, which she knew would go on after her death. Yes, I mean, Gordon, actually, that Scottish element to the proceedings that we've witnessed this week, and actually, I mean, that march down the Royal Mile seems a long time ago, doesn't it, now? Um, but, yeah. but, but that Scottish element was so, it's been so significant and touching and so important to the people of her beloved Scotland. Mm. Even the journey Princess Anne took with her late mother snaking through the Scottish Highlands and yeah. with the tractors pulling over on the yeah. side to pay their respects. I mean, in a way, it seemed as if that had been entirely designed in the Queen's memory. Uh, look, I, I think if the Queen could have chosen the manner and place of her passing, that is what she would have chosen. She, she died in Balmoral. I think she, I think we've we've said, you know, many times in, in the past that, uh, you know, it was her favourite place. And if she if she could choose somewhere to spend her final days, that would have been where she would have chosen. Um, and she died um, very peacefully and, and very quickly, as far as uh, we, we, we understand. She was meeting Liz Truss only two days before, as we all saw. Um, so I, I think in terms of the um, constitutional element, uh, undoubtedly, uh, I think the, the fact that she 
the people of Scotland were the first to be able to pay their respects. The fact that she was taken to uh, Hollywood House and then St Giles's Cathedral um, will be something which, um, let's be honest, you, you know, if if the in terms of the keeping the union together, mm. um, that will have been seen as a as a positive thing. That uh, it will have um, reminded people how much the monarchy is um, is loved in Scotland. Um, and uh, it was it was hugely significant, I think, yeah. Well, with the world's bigwigs arriving here at uh, Westminster Abbey as we speak, let's just talk about the soft power punch of the monarchy. <laughs> we had the Princess of Wales meeting um, Elena Zelensky yesterday, which sends a message to the world, doesn't it, Christopher? It does. Uh, the uh, disinvitation, if we can put it like that, of Vladimir Putin, of yeah. uh, the Belarusian leader, um, Myanmar's uh, representatives, and indeed the decision uh, by Mohammed bin Salman to withdraw um, amid allegations of his involvement uh, with the murder of a journalist, which he denies, I should stress. Um, and then this huge global gathering last night at the palace. I mean, people say the queen was the one who was the glue who held the Commonwealth together. Can the king fill these shoes? What's your view on that, Christopher? I think, I think he can. Um, whether he succeeds in doing so remains to be seen. It will be a very, very tough job. Um, I don't know what Gordon thinks about this, but mm. my, my view is that the Commonwealth were very happy with the Queen, but I'm not sure they were altogether committed to the office, as it were, if mm. you see what I mean. Yeah, they, I they think preferred it was, the individual to the institution. I think it may have been personal. <laughs> it th may have been personal. Yeah, I, I think there's two things I would, I would say. That I was thinking last night, um, what other event would there be where you would have this many world leaders gathering in one place, um, uh, you know, apart from another royal funeral at some point in the future. I'm not, I'm struggling to think of another event where you would have this number and th this sh sort of saturation of world leaders all, all coming together in one place, which is, uh, you know, speaks to your point, Camilla, about the, the soft power of the monarchy. Well, let's also, also, sorry, Gordon, I was going to say, look at the crowds there outside mm. the Queen Victoria Memorial. And I was up very, very early this morning doing broadcasting, 5 a.m. The train was pretty busy. Yeah. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what politician would attract crowds like this? I mean, mm. yeah. I, I get perhaps, you know, the comparison might be made with the inaugural address um, at the White House. Who's this, Christopher, now? Uh, this is the Mass Pipes and Drums. Um, probably the biggest assembly of pipers that we've seen on the streets of London in many a long year. Um, instant, they're, they're drawn from all three services, um, led by the drum major of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards, otherwise known as the Scots Greys, um, but they are from both the, the, the Army, the Navy and the RAF. And the Queen loved piping. She certainly did, she had her own personal pipe pack who actually gave a very moving um, interview talking about how kind she had been towards him when his wife was ill, saying to him, if I don't hear you tomorrow morning, don't worry, you don't need to tell anyone, you just get to the hospital, which he obviously clearly cherished. Um, still more dignitaries uh, gathering outside Westminster Abbey here. You're listening to me, Camilla Tomney, Associate Editor of The Telegraph. I'm joined by Christopher Joel, military historian, former soldier, and Gordon Rayner, my fellow Associate Editor at The Telegraph. I mean, there's a bit of a waiting game, but everything is done by minute to minute. Um, as we've just seen there, the pipers marching down. Christopher, from a um, cavalryman's point of view, can you explain the need for this sand? The sand has fascinated people because oh. it's been drafted in to um, New Palace Yard there. So um, normally there isn't the sand there. It's just cobblestones. Explain the, the need for having the sand. Um, the need is very straightforward. Um, it stops horses slipping on the tarmac. Um, for a horse shod with iron shoes, tarmac is quite a slippy surface. So they put down the sand so that there are no issues. Um, there are, I don't believe there are any carriages on this procession, but you'll see exactly the same thing is done when there are carriage processions because the carriage horses mm -hmm. pulling a large weight behind them can have problems. This is the detachment of the Royal Navy coming in for the coffin. I, I was just going to say on the, on the sand point, that I think the other, the other purpose it has is that when the gun carriage uh, pulls the coffin, you don't want that gun carriage joggling along on, on cobbles when you have um, 
you know, sort of precious cargo, uh, and uh, it, it obviously sort of deadens the uh, uh, the sound, but also smooths out those cobbles. And uh, I, I, I saw the the palace staff af after the Queen's coffin was brought into Westminster Hall uh, on Wednesday. Um, the the palace staff were straight out there afterwards, clearing away all the sand, and then of course they've had to put it all back down again. So yeah. quite an operation. Let's talk about the um, unique relationship between the late Queen and the Royal Navy, the daughter of a Royal Navy officer, the yep. wife of a Royal Navy officer, the mother of a Royal Navy officer, Christopher. Yes, indeed, two Royal Navy officers. Um, yes, indeed. <laughs> in as much as that, uh, the King served, he did his initial military service in the Royal Navy. Yes, I was, uh, yeah, that's very, you see, a military man would make that correction. <laughs> of course, I refer to the Duke of York and Indeed. his Falkland service. He was flying helicopters, but he was doing it for the Royal Navy. Carry on, Christopher, and explain um, that unique. She's obviously wanted them to have an absolutely central role in this. Yes, but I think there is another thing, Camilla. They are, of course, the senior service. So they take precedence over the Army and the Royal Air Force. They have a right to, to do this. Of course, the right to pull the coffin was an accident. Explain why. At the funeral of Queen Victoria in 1901, um, her coffin was supposed to be drawn by the Royal Horse Artillery. And the, the team that was waiting for her, the, the horse team that was waiting for her at um, Windsor Station when the coffin arrived from London, um, got very cold and fractious and one of the horses kicked over the traces and in fact broke what's called a splinter bar. Um, that meant that they couldn't pull the hearse, um, which was the gun carriage. And there was a terrific amount of squabbling amongst the, the different crowned heads who were gathered there. And eventually Prince Louis of Battenberg, who was in charge of the Naval Guard of Honour, said, well, my sailors can pull it, sir. And the king, Edward VII, said, well, if they can, they better get on with it, otherwise, otherwise my mother's never going to get buried. Yes. And what started as necessity ended up as a tradition. Amazing. And when you say that the Royal Navy is the senior service, again, forgive my ignorance, why is that? Uh, I'm a military man, I can't <laughs> possibly well, tell the, you that. Well, it's the oldest, isn't it? <laughs> it's the oldest. I suppose that's true. Yeah. Um, we had a Royal Navy before there was a standing army. Correct. And a long time before we had an Air Force. Yes. Now, uh, um, that looks to me, Gordon, as if that is the beast and that is mm, President yeah. Joe Biden's motorcade seemingly um, just waiting to come in there and not stuck in traffic because there is no traffic yeah. um, on the streets of London right now. All of these roads have been closed. Yeah. Um, some people coming in by bus, some people coming in by beast, by beast. and motorcade, yeah. uh, Gordon. Mm. Is this uh, about, you know, my economy is bigger than yours, therefore so is my make motorcade. What, how has uh, this worked out? No, I think it's very much uh, about uh, I am just more important than you are uh, when it comes down to it. I think, I, I think the president will say I'm the leader of the free world. Uh, I can't possibly travel by bus. Uh, it's too dangerous. He uh, always travels in a, an armoured car that has its own, you know, has its own climate. You know, it's, it's yes. completely uh, hermetically sealed. Um, so uh, as I say, it'd be fascinating to see if anybody else is granted that privilege, but it looks as though he may be the only one. It's amazing, isn't it? When they pulled up outside Buckingham Palace, around the back of the garden, the doors on that thing are a foot wide. Yeah. They wouldn't let the footman open the doors, the Secret Service, and um, Ch Tony Johnson Burt, who's the head of the Master of the Queen's Household, went to sort of meet and greet and had to wait because there was this big hullabaloo around opening these doors, even though the entire area had been sterile for hours and there are SAS on the roof. I mean, uh, what's the worst that could happen, Christopher? Honestly, they couldn't be safer, could they, than in the garden of Buckingham Palace? No, I don't suppose they could, but um, if you're the President of the United States, I think paranoia doesn't really come into <laughs> it. Um, buses continuing to come in here at Westminster Abbey. It's now five minutes past ten, so we've half an hour to go until the arrivals end and we see this bearer party for the first time. Let's talk about some of the narrative, and, and we'll break into this um, when we see people arriving so we can identify um, them for you, for those watching. And thank you for joining us this morning on the Telegraph live stream. Um, the narrative around this, um, Gordon, the... Uh, writing that we've all done, me particularly about the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Mm. 
What are your thoughts after 10 days of this talk of the rift? Is it a truce? Is it lasting peace? What do the royals think about all of this coverage, do you think? Well, I thought it was fascinating uh, last weekend when uh, the um, Prince and Princess of Wales uh, came out at Windsor with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex to look at the floral tributes and to greet the crowds because uh, you and I were both working that day, uh, we were in the newsroom together uh, and uh, there was a lot of um, doubt about exactly how the Duke of Sussex was going to be treated in all of this because they weren't saying at that point whether he was going to be included in any of the processions, whether he was going to be allowed to walk behind the coffin. Um, and uh, I think they sensed that there was a, a, a bit of a row building up and that uh, they might um, end up with some negative stories. Uh, so lo and behold, we saw them uh, appear together and um, we were all writing stories about the truce. And here comes the beast. Yeah, let's see the beast then. And uh, Joe Biden and his wife, Dr. Jill Biden, there. He paid a very moving tribute to the Queen yesterday when he signed that book of condolence at Lancaster House, made comparisons between her and his own mother. Let's just watch them step out of this car and make their way into the Abbey. Um, I mean, he only knew the Queen briefly, but it's interesting how movingly Biden has spoken about HM, isn't it? Well, he had a, um, a pre-prepared statement that he was writing in the book of condolence that he brought with him but actually when he was talking off the cuff he was very eloquent and uh, and it, it, what he said was very moving he obviously is a man who has and there's those very very thick doors you were referring to crazy um he's a man who has experienced terrible loss in his life he lost his wife and daughter in the 70s in a car crash uh, his son Bo died um seven years ago and he was talking about how it leaves an enormous hole in your life that, you, that you're not sure if it'll be filled. Christopher, you were um, pointing, you were identifying perhaps. I was identifying the Crown Equerry, who's uh, the Blues and Royals officer, who of course is in charge of all the, um, the motorcade. Wow. All, all the transport arrangements for this funeral are his responsibility. So it's not surprising that he's on the pavement um, meeting and greeting. Um, now, he is dressed in morning dress, Gordon, mm. but actually the dress code for this, when we consider the last time we saw these scenes was 1965 and it mm. was black and white and people were in bowler hats. And yeah. um, Actually, this dress code for this service today is a little more relaxed. Women have been told what? They can wear hats, but I believe trouser suits. Yes, and also uh, we are seeing um, uh, the, the men are all bareheaded, aren't they? And they're not wearing morning uh, coats. S which, some are, some are. Yeah, mm -hmm. probably there would have been frock coats, uh, yeah. morning coats in the back in the day that we, pretty much every every man would have worn who attended. Um, there well, is, in fact, there Biden is someone who's wearing, wearing a suit. Morning, yeah, mm. yeah. The president was wearing a suit, but whoever's going in yes. now is in a, in a morning coat. Yeah. I mean, that's a sign of the times, isn't it? Yes. Um, hats we, we we will forever associate with the late Queen, but. Um, the idea that people are here in lounge suits, and it was the same for the um, state reception last night, wasn't it? I mean, it's not a cause for celebration. It's not a white tie dinner that you would expect in happier times if there was a state visit. But it was actually, uh, um, obviously, a, an extremely high level event. But drinks and canopies in the state apartments, a chance perhaps for some of these world leaders to just put politics aside for the night. And presumably as well, Christopher, the likes of Joe Biden, and we've, we, we saw it when the Obamas came in. I mean, they loved meeting the royals. There'd be a lot of yeah. these world leaders would be delighted to see the Princess of Wales and others, right? I mean, I think the big difference is that the President of the United States is here for a maximum of two four-year terms. Yes. The Prince and Princess of Wales are there for as long as they're Prince and Princess of Wales. I mean, mm. the, cu the current King was Prince of Wales for how many years? Yes. An awful long time longest serving heir apparent in history. I mean, what an apprenticeship, really. We were talking earlier, weren't we, about whether he can keep the Commonwealth together. He gave an interesting speech, um, his first as head of the Commonwealth Heads of Government in Rwanda in the summer, where he spoke, Gordon, about if Commonwealth realms, like the likes of Jamaica, who I think have indicated they want to become a republic by 2025, yeah. if these Commonwealth realms want to go, then they should be able to do so calmly and without rancor. Now, yeah. that, People do confuse the Commonwealth with yeah. the Crown Commonwealth, don't they? 
Yeah, Commonwealth realms are the, the countries which have uh, the, well, the king as it is now as the head of state. So countries like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, even Papua New Guinea, which is the one I always find um, the most uh, surprising. Uh, I think Charles um, appreciates um, just how sort of archaic it is really to, for a country like Australia to have a head of state who lives on the other side of the world and who is only able to visit occasionally. And obviously the Queen hadn't been there for um, quite some time, getting on for 10 years by the time she died. Um, so I, I, think, I think people make the mistake of thinking that the, the King is desperate to hang on to all these Commonwealth realms, that, that he'll see it as some terrible tragedy if they all become republics. I, I really don't think that's the case. I think he understands um, that in, in the 21st century, um, the idea of them having the, the, the monarch of Great Britain as their head of state may seem a little bit uh, odd. Um, and you and I have both been to a lot of these countries and it, it does seem rather strange when you're, when you're there to think of the arrangement that they have. Um, and it, it, I, I'm always quite surprised that we still have 14 countries that have yes. you know, the king as the head of state. Although for Barbados to go independent mm. on just the basis of the say-so of 29 politicians, yeah. no referendum. No. I mean, it's funny, the Americans often keep on citing Barbados. You know, a lot of left-leading coverage is talking about you know, the end of the Commonwealth and Britain's influence and saying, oh, the king can't possibly uh, follow in his mother's footsteps. However, What's interesting about Charles III is he is very pro-diversity. Mm. He's very pro-multi-faith because we, we've, we know there'd been talk about him not being a defender of the faith, but of faiths. They've rode away from that. The coronation mm. oath will remain the same. But he's, he's given a speech in which he's tried to appeal to people from all backgrounds. So actually, if anyone can ref reflect these kind of post-George Floyd Black Lives Matter times, a man who set up the Prince's Trust in the aftermath of the Brixton riots, who has tried to reach out to disaffected young people, white and black. Actually, Christopher, maybe he can do this. I, I think we also need to make the distinction that, uh, emphasise the distinction that Gordon made, which is that there's the, the countries of the Commonwealth where the king is head of state, but then there's the rest. And in fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if within 10 years, Charles III is not head of state of the majority of the Commonwealth countries, but that doesn't mean to say they'll leave the Commonwealth. Mm. The Commonwealth as a club, with him as its head, is, is the important thing. And it's growing. Yeah. They've got people queuing up to see Absolutely. Yeah. But the influence of China, mm. Gordon, I mean, perhaps countries, I think yeah. Mozambique has just joined, yeah. uh, Togo, yeah. um, others, Zimbabwe wants to get back in. Yeah. Um, well, with, the, yeah. with the growing influence of China and Russia, actually being a member of the Commonwealth isn't mm. a bad idea. No, I, th I think this is where we see um, the Crown and, and uh, the government working hand in hand, perhaps more than an, any other time, because, you, as you say, the, the Commonwealth has grown. I think there were only seven Commonwealth countries when the Queen um, uh, ascended the throne. There are now 54, I believe. Uh, so there are 40 Commonwealth countries where the King is not the head of state. Yeah. Um, and as you say, people want to join. And in, a, in an era where China is um, increasingly um, going to, to foreign countries, buying up resources, um, I think it is a, a very useful counterpoint from a political point of view. Um, mm. You know, let, let's, not, let's not shy away from that. Um, scenes on the uh, mall there, um, spectacular as ever with the union flags. People having queued again for hours, getting on the train in the middle of the night to try and get here to get a coveted spot. People camping out, which is something we've seen. I mean, this has been the people's morning, hasn't it? This has been an opportunity for the public, I think, on an unprecedented scale in a multimedia age to mm. get up close and personal with royals, Christopher, to sort of film them on their iPhones extraordinarily. Why do you think they've decided, I think, to go over and above when it comes to some of the walkabouts and meet and greets they've done? Oh, I think the, the new king is very keen to show that he is, as it were, a man of the people, that he's not going to be remote and haughty and sitting on his throne, that he's in there amongst them. He, the, the fact is that the king no longer rules by divine right, but by the will of the people. And I think you've seen the a lot of evidence of that in, in the last 10 days, and I think you'll continue to see it. Gordon, I think, mm. sorry, carry on. Well, I think the thing that strikes me is that in this 
multimedia age you've just referred to, you would think that there would be smaller crowds. Yes. But not, the crowds are bigger. Indeed. And Gordon, I think the King has been somewhat overwhelmed by the warmth of the response. Yeah, I, th I think, obviously, he didn't know what the response would be. Um, and I, I think that when th there's been a lot of talk before um, the Queen's death about whether um, the, the, the monarchy would, would sort of fall into decline um, because of the Queen being so loved by, by people not just here but around the world. Um, but I think what people have underestimated is that when Charles became king, people see him differently straight away. He, he becomes the, the head of our country. Sorry, you were going I to... Think I, I, I think that might be Nicola Sturgeon. It's hard to um, identify people from behind, but it might be the Scottish First Minister there just entering the church. Carry on, Gordon. Um, yeah, I don't... Nicola's got slightly more lighter hair than that, I think, but anyway. No, I think it, I just, the back of the hair is distinctive. Okay. <laughs> it is Nicholas oh, Sturgeon. Sturgeon. I, I, um, yeah. I know my Scottish nationalists, um, <laughs> strangely, from doing political yes. copy. I think this is the Emperor of Japan. Uh, yes. Uh, wearing a face mask, yeah. Um, yeah. as is the habit, frankly, in um, Far Eastern nations and has been for many, many years before COVID even reared its head. Um, it, it'd be fascinating to know who's been in the buses and who's been allowed to come well, in he's their own con con conveyed by car. I mean, a blacked out sort of um, yeah. minivan type affair, so not particularly glamorous. But at the same time, we did hear that there was a bristling of resentment over mm. the idea of putting the Japanese emperor in the well, back of the bus. Well, he is an emperor. He's an emperor, yeah. Gordon. Is he, he the only emperor that's at this event, has it? The only one I can um, think of. Yeah, yeah I think one he I is the only of. one we can think of, yes. Um, let's keep on. Um, and of course, his grandfather was a god. Yes. So I think just to just to go back to the point about the king, uh, the um, yes, I think he has been very gratified by the uh, the support that that people have shown to him. Um, but I think what what's fascinating has been, as you said, all of these walkabouts they've done. There have been a lot of them. They've been impromptu. Obviously, it's easy to forget that that the queen was ninety six and was not very mobile towards the end of her life. So we haven't seen her doing those sorts of walkabouts for quite some time now. Mm. So it it does feel quite different to see the monarch just going out and about and, and literally popping out of his front door um, at Buckingham Palace or Clarence House and, and just going and mingling with the crowds or uh, and meeting as many people as he can. And, you know, that's been very, very well received. I, I thought in particular when he and the Prince of Wales went to the queue um, to go and thank people for spending so long uh, standing in you know, 12 hours or longer to see the, uh, the, the lying in state. Um, that was very informal. It was it was unexpected, um, and I think he he he's look he's not a stupid man. He knows that he needs to become as popular as he can be because that's what the monarchy depends on. If people decide mm. they don't like the monarchy anymore, then we won't have one. Um, mm. So he he gets that. And um, Christopher, does the Queen Consort make him more popular? I, we might not have believed that I would come out with that phrase 25 years ago. Yeah. Mm. But there's, she's been taken into people's hearts. That's Carrie Johnson and yep. Boris mm. Johnson, former prime minister, arriving there um, again. No bus for them. No bus for them. Um, but equally, of course, no not, morning coat either. No, no. no morning coat, <laughs> but also not the trappings of his previous life. I remember once meeting Tony Abbott the former Prime Minister of Australia, and the last time I'd seen him, oh, there's David, David Cameron, Cameron and his and wife, And he is in a morning coat. <laughs> yes. Isn't it striking? Yeah. From one Etonian to another. Yeah. Well, yeah. What's your personal view, Christopher, that, well, that you should? I think, I, I certainly think you should be in morning coat. And I mean, the extraordinary thing is that um, all Etonians wear morning coats when they're at school. Yes. So <laughs> even though Boris couldn't fit into his, he's certainly, um, he's certainly no stranger to one. Um, there are two things that really strike me so far in this. First of all, the lack of uniforms. At mm. the funeral of George VI, almost all the foreign heads of state, one way or another, were in uniform. And most of the courtiers, in fact all of the courtiers, and most of the people in attendance in the Abbey were in one form of uniform or another. And the other thing that strikes me is, is the, um, the lack of soldiers. Uh, the funeral of George VI, they were shoulder to shoulder everywhere along the, the route. And of course, there's a simple answer to both of those observations, mm. or rather simple. The first one is that the habit of wearing court uniform and the habits of wearing uniforms generally has fallen into 
either disuse or disfavour. I think Brown. that's Sarah Brown and yeah. Gordon Brown, yes, former is. Prime Minister, who actually seem to be having a very cordial chat with Boris Johnson at the Accession <laughs> Council ceremony, yeah. uh, which was, goodness me, um, a week ago. Tony yeah. Blair, is Sherry with him? Yes, she is. Yeah. Swinging her handbag. Where we are. She didn't enjoy Balmoral, although she did conceive Leo there. Yes, so she it can't have been all that too bad. cold. And there's John Major. Fascinating <laughs> that the Prime Ministers have all turned up at once, isn't it? Yes. I, I think that's deliberate. Of course. Must but, be. Uh, yeah. Must be. They've, all, they've turned up in kind of chronological... Oh no, where's Theresa May? She'll be there any second, She'll I'm sure. She'll be there, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I was just going to say about, you know, being a leader. And I, I met once Tony Abbott, the former Australian Prime Minister, on, in a standard carriage on the way home from um, a Tory party conference one year. Standard class. Standard yeah. class, yeah. yeah. And I was like, uh, last time I saw you, you were accompanying um, now the Prince and Princess of Wales around Australia in a motorcade. Mm. Now you're on a GNLAR train or whatever. Yeah. And he goes, well, you know, uh, politics, your career never ends well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, you see um, Boris Johnson there, you know, one minute, um, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and probably would have delivered uh, this reading that is now fallen yes. to Liz Truscorden. And there's nothing so ex as an ex-Prime Minister as we no, know. That's uh, right. You and I have seen ex-Prime Ministers shuffling around um, Parliament and, and it, it, bizarrely people hardly give them a second glance. It seems so so weird when you were used to seeing them walking around with an entourage, you know, only days before they lost their jobs. Um, Although he didn't have to go in the bus. No, he didn't. No. That would have been a little um, undignified, I think. Let's talk about the policing operation here, because we can see the Metropolitan Police officers there in their ceremonial uniforms, yep. which always look immaculate, don't they, with their um, white gloves. I mean, goodness me, this is on a scale, um, security-wise, that we haven't seen in a long time. Yeah, well, the... the um the Metropolitan Police uh, said earlier this week, didn't they, it's the biggest policing operation ever um, in this country. Um, they didn't give exact numbers at the time, but they said that it would be bigger than certainly, the, well, obviously everything, but the Platinum Jubilee, there were 15,000 officers on duty at, at the peak times, similar during the 2012 Olympics. So we're going to have uh, considerably more than that uh, on duty uh, today. and. Uh, 2,000 officers from other forces around the country. Um, almost every force in Britain has lent officers to the operation today. Um, so incredible amount of um, organisation and not just not just bobbies on the beach standing uh, lining the route but we've uh, we know that they're having to use divers uh, to you know keep an eye on the Thames. They've got obviously uh, dog handlers, mounted police, um, people uh, monitoring the CCTV, helicopters, absolutely every um, you know, officer and item at their disposal. Amazing. Um, if you're just joining us, it's me, Camilla Tomini, associate, ed associate editor even at The Telegraph, joined by uh, military historian Christopher Joll and Gordon Rayner, my fellow associate editor. We're just looking at the scene there on the mile because the procession is going to go towards Wellington Arch after the main funeral ceremony. We're about 10 minutes out from the moment the bearer party found by the Queen's Company 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards are going to lift the coffin from the catafalque in Westminster Hall and carry it to the north door. I mean, that has been the sort of focus of mourning for the last four days. A strangely mesmerizing, Gordon and I both went in there to write pieces. Gordon, uh, mm. Christopher, did you manage to go into the lying in state? No. No, um, unfortunately not. The, the stillness and the solemnity in that room, Gordon, that yeah. we often walk through for work because we're based in Westminster some yeah. of the time. Quite extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a hugely impressive building. And I, I think that the building itself um, is, part of the, uh, is part of the atmosphere. Is this going to be Theresa May? Um, that's, no, that's Simon, Simon Case, Case. Uh, who is the cabinet secretary, the most yeah. senior civil servant in the land. Um, oh, no, is that's that Liz Truss? Yes, with, with and Liz her Truss. husband Hugh O'Leary there. Um, yeah. We can tell even from behind that that's Liz Truss. Yeah. R remind us again, Gordon, what reading she's doing. So uh, Liz Truss is going to be uh, reading from uh, the Gospel of St John, uh, chapter 14. Uh, it is the passage from the Last Supper where um, Christ um, reassured his disciples uh, and told them that uh, in my house there are many mansions. Um, it's a reading that people will be very familiar with from um, funeral services. It's a very traditional uh, reading for occasions like this. 
I mean, we're nowhere nearing it because once the Prime Minister arrives, you know, we've had Joe Biden in already, Christopher. Yeah. Uh, we're then really coming to, to the moment. Um, and what's been your takeaway as we approach the grand finale, if you like, of this extraordinary period of mourning? Um, looking at this, I think you're 73, if you don't mind me telling you, and you've oh, yeah. been involved in the military. And you've looking watched very events, well on it. Looking very oh, good on it. You've watched you. events like this very closely for very many years. Uh -huh. What, what do you make of the last 10 days? I think it's, without doubt, the most dignified ceremony or series of ceremonies that I've ever seen. You know, from the, from the, the march up the, the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, I mean, everything about it has been, I come back, that's just that one word, dignified. And I suppose another second word, appropriate. Yes. Now this strikes me, Gordon, yeah. because it's accompanied by an Audi, and my and my royal hat is it's a royal party, my, yeah. my royal alarm bells are ringing yeah. here. That looks like a royal party yeah. being yeah. conveyed yeah. very, very slowly down the mile there. Yes, everyone else has come along via Millbank, haven't they? So this is different. So, so I think we'll probably see uh, the um, well, slightly more junior members of the royal family, if we can call them that. Mm -hmm. um, we know, obviously, that uh, uh, as we said earlier, most of the senior male members of the royal family and the Princess Royal will be walking behind the coffin. So um, I think we will probably see the likes of uh, the Duchess of Gloucester, perhaps the Duchess of Kent, mm. um, perhaps uh, Princesses Beatrice and Eugenie, um, probably not uh, the Princess of Wales. Uh, I think she, I would imagine she'll arrive um, in a car. In a state car. But we'll, uh, now why we have they stopped? I mean, it might be stopping um, I was thinking, why, is, why are they driving so slowly? Well, A, there's a timetable um, down yeah. to the very last second, and mm. look, these buses are now in the way. Oh dear, there's a traffic um, jam. There's a tra <laughs> traffic jam, but equally, um, I mean, maybe the windows are blacked out. I was going to suggest it might be so that people could wave as they've been waiting so patiently the side of the mall there. Yeah, um, they don't like stopping though, do they? It's, it's, not, I, it's um, not safe. No. Years ago, I organized an event at the Guards Chapel, which the Princess Royal was the guest of honor. And um, the queue, everybody was told they had to be in their seats by a certain time. And at that certain time, there was still a queue going into the Guards Chapel. We managed to get a message to the, Prince of, uh, to the Princess Royal's Aquarii, go twice around the wedding cake. Oh, really? Yep. <laughs> How did you find the Princess Royal, Christopher? Because lots of people this week have been actually paying tribute to her stoicism, her stalwart support of her mother, Prince even Michael. Prince yeah. and Princess Prince Michael, Michael of Kent. Kent that's yeah. right, being conveyed there in um, state cars and a minibus. You're right, Gordon. This they were is waiting. The, yeah. This is the extended yeah. family, and of yeah. course, yeah. you have to wait in an order because you have to enter in an order Correct. according to precedent, precedence, don't you? Yeah, and it's it's most senior in last. Yeah. Um, if I'm right, that's, that's empty. Best. That's exactly. empty, so that might be taking the Queen Consort because I believe yeah. our colleague Jack Hardy, bless him, had to do a whole piece on that Rolls Royce, which, if I'm not mistaken, is a Phantom Four, of which only 18 were made and only two belonged no, to the Queen. It's not that one, I don't think. Oh, <laughs> oh, no. It is a Rolls Royce, I don't think that's the that Phantom Four. That was my Four. Top, gun, a top Gear moment. I'm sure so. we will see that later, but I don't think it's that one. Um, I. Um, I actually it's the burgundy livery. Know, like, actually, all, they they're all, all the look same the colour. same. My yeah. father would yeah. hate me for saying that because he's a classic car enthusiast. Mm. I, I negotiated the uh, the gift to the Queen in her Silver Jubilee year of the uh, the state limousine with the glass back to it. Mm. Um, Tell us about the Princess Royal. The Princess Royal. I've known her all my well. I've known her all my adult life, on and off. She's a really extraordinary person because she's got. Um, an air about her, which doesn't make her haughty. She's actually, she's very friendly, but you know you're in the presence of a senior member of the royal family whenever you speak to her, and you know exactly where the line is in the sand. But having said that, she's, she's good fun to be with. I enjoy being with her. And also a stickler for protocol like her late mother. Absolutely. But with a very friendly way of expressing herself to people. Somebody described it to me as some, she would come up to you and shake your hand. You don't need to, no. you know, she's very sociable and um, kind. I mean, a kind woman, but yeah. very ma no nonsense as well. But it's, it's been remarked on before. I mean, unlike some, mem some late members of the royal family who, as it were, drew you over the line and then stamped on you. 
The Princess Royal, you know exactly where the line is. You never get drawn over it. There's never an opportunity for Les Majesty. She's a, she's, a, she's a lovely lady, and she's been incredibly dignified throughout the whole of this. Um, well, it's half past 10 now. Um, another significant motorcade sweeping down Whitehall, where, mm. as you can see, crowds are gathered, gathered here, gathered in Green Park, gathered down the mall to see this extraordinary um, display once again of pomp and pageantry. Uh, driving oh. into New Palace Yard there, um, must be senior royals well, again, these, Gordon. Yeah, these must be people who are going to take part in the procession because they will need to be inside Westminster Hall. Yes. But isn't it extraordinary how many people we've seen arriving? Yeah. I mean, I think this is a huge enterprise. Yeah. Well, when, when uh, it was very striking when uh, the coffin uh, was taken into Westminster Hall last Wednesday when the end, pretty much the entire royal family the royal turned out. There were on, 50, I'm just going to say, yeah. sorry to break in, Gordon, the royal standards is on that Rolls Royce. Yeah. That is the Phantom Four. Well, let's just check. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. it must be because that's what the king has been driving around in all week with the Queen Consort. Yes. Yes. And its large windows and frame makes it the appropriate car for people to see. Yes. I, well, we can't see it at the moment because all we can see is the back of a Rolls Royce well, Cullinan. I reckon since it pulled out of Clarence House that that's the king. Yes. Mm. Um, and uh, I would imagine as well. I mean, we're watching this, and I feel slightly nervous. And then imagine being a member of the royal family on show, Ooh. once again having to do this procession in lockstep. I mean, you're the out of the three of us. Let's be honest here, Christopher. You're the best trained in this. <laughs> How? Um, frightening and nerve-wracking is it to be on display in uniform like this or indeed on display in a procession like this? It's pretty nerve-wracking. Um, it's easier when you're on your feet than when you're on a horse, from yes. enough, because you only have to worry about your own feet, whilst when you're on a horse you've got to worry about nearly a ton of, um, mm. of horse flesh mm. that might do anything underneath you. Um, and they do. We see it. Um, we saw um, it tripping, tripping the colour um, yep. early this year, didn't we? Yep. There was a, a horse that threw its rider. Well, also some of the horses, a couple of the horses involved in the procession on Wednesday, and it sort of seemed to be rearing their heads a lot mm. with um, people riding them. And I thought, goodness me, what a task that is to keep that carriage going to make sure that there's no problems. Do they prepare the horses for this in some way, Christopher? Oh, yes. Are they used to these crowds, yes. first of all? And what sort of things might they do? behind the scenes to make sure that none of these horses sort of rear up and get frightened? Two things. First of all, they're trained in, as it were, crowd management, so loud bangs are made in front of them. And the other thing is, on the day of any ceremonial, they're all well exercised before they go on the uh, parade. So they're, they're quite tired by the time they get to the parade. Prince Michael, Prince Michael, of, Prince Kent. Michael of Kent in RAF uniform. And is that the Duke of Kent uh, on the far side? Ah, yes, yeah. it is, Gordon. Yeah, and he's also in RAF uniform. Um, yes. These he's are the Queen's cousins, of course, yeah. we should point out. Duke of um, Kent is, he struggles a bit with his walking, and uh, uh, he's going to be in the procession uh, mm. behind the coffin. He's incredibly brave uh, of him. Yes. He's actually walking better than he was. I, I saw him in Westminster Hall earlier in the week, and, and he looked um, as if he was very sore. Uh, <laughs> How old is he, Gordon? 86? Yeah, um, yes. And He's no spring chicken. No. He, he was my instructor at Sandhurst. Was oh, he? really? Yeah, what was that so like? He was wonderful. I loved him. Great chap. Really? Yeah. I saw him quite recently because I interviewed his wife, the Duchess, at Wren House in Kensington Palace. And, um, ah, that's the Princess Queen's Sa lady. Uh, no, no, Princess, Princess, Princess Alexandra. Princess yeah. Alexandra. Um, I interviewed him at Wren House and... Um, he answered uh, her at Ren House, and he answered the door and took no. me somewhat by surprise. Just dressed down, I said, "Hello, yeah. Your Royal Highness. Nice to see you." Mm. Um, his wife's uh, absolutely adorable, lovely, yeah. lovely lady. Now, is, um, this, is this the king that we're going to see? Well, I think it must be. It's not the Phantom Four, I'm afraid. Oh, God! <laughs> right, well, that's my um, career as a motoring correspondent over <laughs> before it's no even top started. Thing, no, no, indeed not. I mean, to be fair, I think politics and royals is probably a brief enough, uh, yeah. adding cars to it. Um, although, as I say, my father will be horrified. 
um, Princess Alexandra there yeah. making her way. She's a royal trooper who does a great job completely without fanfare. Yes, she never gets any coverage at all. Never gets she? any coverage um, or credit. Princess uh, Beatrice there. Yeah. The Duchess of York is yes. here oh, and Fergie. Yes. Yeah. Now, actually, um, uh, let's be perfectly honest. The Duke of Edinburgh was never much of a fan and never really forgave her for some of the sordid headlines in the 1990s. However, the late Queen remained very close to the Duchess of York and always said to her husband, so she would invite her up to Balmoral when Prince Philip was down in the Isle of Wight for Cow's Week, and always used to say to her husband, whatever you say about Fergie, she's been a very, very good mother to those girls. So it's not surprising to see the Duchess of York here, Gordon. No, and the Queen, well, uh, there's a piece about, about it in today's uh, Telegraph, isn't there? The Queen was an incredibly forgiving woman, um, more so than um, perhaps mm, her, her husband or her son. Um, she, uh, she also um, uh, sort of engineered a, a rapprochement with the um, Duke and Duchess of Windsor, uh, former Edward VIII, um, and uh, she, I think she would have been instrumental in trying to bring uh, Princes William and Harry back together. Let's uh, just talk through a few of these yeah. guests, Gordon. There's Zara Phillips, yeah. or yeah. now Tyndall. Her husband, uh, Mike, that you can tell because of his rugby player um, yeah. stance. You can see Lady Louise Windsor there and yeah. James Viscount Seven mm -hmm. um, at the back. What an um, extraordinary display they put on at the grandchildren's vigil. James is only 14. Mm. Um, Lady Louise just done her A-levels, hoping to go off to university. And um, incredibly close to the Wessex children, Gordon, to the Queen because actually because uh, Prince Ed was the baby of the family and born mm. more than a decade after mm. Prince Charles mm. and Princess Anne, uh, by the time uh, Louise and James were growing up, actually the Queen was around more and could see yes. them more at Windsor Castle. Yes, she, she went from being... Um, oh, here we are. Here we are. Um, now, as this begins, those watching, we will go silent because we just want you to take in these scenes as they start playing out with that military precision because it is now 10.36, so the ceremony is beginning. Um, let's just drink in these scenes now. You're joining me, Camilla Tomini, Associate Editor of The Telegraph, on the live stream. Christopher, take us through, and Gordon, who we're seeing here. The very tall chap at the back I know is Paul Wybrew, who is the Queen's uh, closest mm. male tall aide. Paul. Yeah. Tall Paul. He featured in the... Um, James Bond sketch. Exactly. Yeah. Um, who else are we seeing, Christopher? Well, what you've got there, the front, behind, you've got the heralds, and then you've got the Master of the Horse in the very elaborate scarlet and gold uniform. You've got the master of the household. Um, these are senior officers within the royal household itself, the, the most senior probably. Um, and they, behind them, they just done an about turn, are obviously the Royal Navy um, party that will pull the, the gun carriage. So the whole thing is starting um, to assemble. Royal children are now arriving, so of course we can yeah. make out the silhouette of Prince George aged nine, his sister, Princess Charlotte, traveling in with mum, it seems. The Princess of Wales is there in the car with them. And is that the Queen Consort next to her? Or yes, it does look like Camilla. Mm. Um, let's just see them step out for this. I mean, what a daunting prospect to be in the Abbey with 2,000 people, but them at a very young age doing their duty on behalf of their beloved gran great grandmother, Gan Gan, as they called her. Mm. Look, Charlotte, adorable in a She's little a hat. hat. Yeah. And he's and I think, I think George is wearing a sort of uh, a morning coat. Yes. Rather than a suit. We'll see in Let's just a see. second. Uh, Kate, uh, the the Princess of Wales, there in a wide-brimmed black hat. She's there with her um, mm. stepmother-in-law, um, Camilla, Queen Consort. Um, 
is that Sophie Wessex, I believe, yes. Yeah. And then and Meghan, Meghan mm. the Duchess of Sussex, as she now styles herself, following in. Again, I think Gordon travelling with the Countess of Wessex. That's been a theme <laughs> of the week. Yes. Um, the Duchess of Sussex, uh, obviously in an awkward position being here after everything that's been said and done on Oprah and beyond. Mm. However, I mean, Sophie, the peacemaker as ever, taking her under her wing, making sure that she's comfortable here. Yeah, she's been a, a bit of a buffer, I think, hasn't she? And uh, we saw her um, at the uh, in Westminster Hall standing next to the Duchess of Sussex. Well, senior royals there going into Westminster Abbey. Um, we're about 20 minutes out from this actual service starting, but of course we have the spectacle to come um, imminently of the Queen's coffin being taken from that catafalque. Um, it's only around the corner in Westminster Hall, but of course, as we have witnessed in the past 10 days, every single moment will be executed with the utmost dignity. Um, and we're going to see those scenes play out now as the bearer party here prepares for the coffin to leave Westminster Hall very shortly, Christopher. Everyone has obviously arrived because the Crown Equerry has just gone into the Abbey and taken his cocked hat off. So I think you can take that as a sign, no more arrivals at the Abbey from, through, that, uh, through that door. Um, focus now shifts entirely um, to Westminster Hall and the coffin of the late Queen. Seems yeah. like we're not going to see that moment because I think that should have already happened. They should have already moved yeah. yes. the coffin from the catafalque. So, so think we think we'll see the procession emerge, Gordon. Looks that way. And just to remind you, um, watching who's going to be in that procession, we've seen the so-called wives of Windsor go into the um, abbey and we've seen children and grandchildren, indeed great-grandchildren, um, there. Um, at the front of this uh, procession, it's behind the coffin, but it's at the front of the royal procession is the King, the Princess Royal, the Duke of York and the Earl of Wessex. Work, walking behind them will be the Prince of Wales, the Duke of Sussex in the middle, Peter Phillips, uh, the Queen's uh, oldest grandchild, to the left of them. We will then have the Earl of Snowdon, who is Princess Margaret's son, um, the Duke of Gloucester in the middle, and then um, to their side, Sir Tim Lawrence, who will have been married to Princess Anne for 30 years in December. And then behind them will walk the households of the King and the Prince of Wales, members of their households. Let's just watch these scenes now as the coffin is about to emerge. Christopher, just tell me, the lady at the front got a hugely significant role in this, as have the two people behind her. Is, tell yeah, us. That, she's the Lady Usher of the Black Rod. Um, I think the first uh, lady to hold that appointment, who would normally be the Gentleman Usher of the Black Rod, and she, um, she was accompanied by um, the Lord Great... Uh, no, by the Earl Marshal um, in his very elaborate um, uh, full-dress uniform of gold all over a, a, a red... Uh, tail tunic. A um, little bit difficult to tell who the rest of them are just from the rear views, but the arrival of Black Rod and of uh, the Earl Marshal completes the lineup of very senior officers of the royal household, who and we alluded to Earl, earlier. The yeah. Earl Marshal Gordon had a very significant role in all yeah. this. Yes, he organises the entire the entire thing. It's a it's a hereditary uh, role. Uh, always carried up by the Duke of Norfolk and uh, looks as though we're going to see the coffin there.
Uh, Christopher Joel joins me now, military historian, along with Gordon Rayner, just to conclude this, because we want to just left, leave you to watch this uh, without our commentary ruining things. But just, we've seen the royal party there, Christopher. What uniforms are all of the uh, royal men wearing there? Well, His Majesty the King is in his uniform, an Admiral of the Fleet of the Royal Navy. The Princess Royal, again, in her Admiral's uniform of the Royal Navy. Um, Prince William, the Prince of Wales, in his RAF uniform. And then, obviously, Duke of York and Duke of Sussex in no uniform at all. And the Earl of Wessex and Forfar is um, in his uniform, the Colonel of the Royal Wessex Yeomanry. Um, Gordon, Christopher, thank you so much for your commentary over the last hour. We're going to leave you just to watch this live stream now and we will be back with you after the service with some thoughts um, and some commentary to come. But for now, we leave you with the state funeral of Queen Elizabeth II.
had to raise. Raise. Power party, Edwards. Fire. Still, Barra party, slow, march.
in grief and also in, <clears throat> in profound thanksgiving, we come to this house of God, to a place of prayer, to a church where remembrance and hope are sacred duties. Here, where Queen Elizabeth was married and crowned, we gather from across the nation, from the Commonwealth, and from the nations of the world to mourn our loss, to remember her long life of selfless service, and ensure confidence to commit her to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. With gratitude, we remember her unswerving commitment to a high calling over so many years as Queen and Head of the Commonwealth. With admiration, we recall her lifelong sense of duty and dedication to her people. With thanksgiving, we praise God for her constant example of Christian faith and devotion. With affection, we recall her love for her family and her commitment to the causes she held dear. Now, in silence, let us in our hearts and minds recall our many reasons for thanksgiving. Pray for all members of her family and commend Queen Elizabeth to the care and keeping of Almighty God. O oh, merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, in whom whosoever believeth shall live, though he die, and whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall not die eternally. Who has taught us by his holy apostle St. Paul not to be sorry as men without hope for them that sleep in him. We meekly beseech thee, O Father, to raise us from the death of sin unto the life of righteousness, that when we shall depart this life, we may rest in him as our hope is, this our sister doth. And that at the general resurrection in the last day, we may be found acceptable in thy sight and receive that blessing which thy well-beloved Son shall then pronounce to all that love and fear thee, saying, Come, ye blessed children of my Father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. Grant this, we beseech thee, O merciful Father, through Jesus Christ, our Mediator and Redeemer.
Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Thanks be to God. Holy Spirit, 
and fill our hearts with the balm of your healing love. Amen. The pattern for many leaders is to be exalted in life and forgotten after death. The pattern for all who serve God, famous or obscure, respected or ignored, is that death is the door to glory. Her late majesty famously declared on a 21st birthday broadcast that her whole life would be dedicated to serving the nation and commonwealth. Rarely has such a promise been so well kept. Few leaders receive the outpouring of love that we have seen. Jesus, who in our reading does not tell his disciples how to follow, but who to follow, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Her late majesty's example was not set through her position or her ambition, but through whom she followed. I know His Majesty shares the same faith and hope in Jesus Christ as His Mother, the same sense of service and duty. In 1953, the Queen began her coronation with silent prayer, just there, at the High Altar. Her allegiance to God was given before any person gave allegiance to her. Her service to so many people in this nation, the Commonwealth and the world, had its foundation in her following Christ, God himself, who said that he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. People of loving service are rare in any walk of life. Leaders of loving service are still rarer. But in all cases, those who serve will be loved and remembered when those who cling to power and privileges are long forgotten. The grief of this day, felt not only by the late Queen's family, but all round the nation, the Commonwealth and the world, arises from her abundant life and loving service, now gone from us. She was joyful, present to so many, touching a multitude of lives. And we pray today especially for all her family, grieving as every family at a funeral, including so many families around the world who have themselves lost someone recently. But in this family's case, doing so in the brightest spotlight. May God heal their sorrow May the gap left in their lives be marked with memories of joy and life. Her late majesty's broadcast during COVID lockdown ended with, we will meet again. Words of hope from a song of Vera Lynn. Christian hope means certain expectation of something not yet seen. Christ rose from the dead and offers life to all, abundant life now 
and life with God in eternity. As the Christmas carol says, where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. We will all face the merciful judgment of God. We can all share the Queen's hope, which in life and death inspired her servant leadership. Service in life, hope in death. All who follow the Queen's example and inspiration of trust and faith in God can with her say, we will meet again. In confidence and trust, let us pray to the Father. 
Let us give thanks to God for Queen Elizabeth's long life and reign, recalling with gratitude her gifts of wisdom, diligence, and service. O God, from whom cometh everything that is upright and true, accept our thanks for the gifts of heart and mind that thou didst bestow upon thy daughter Elizabeth, and which she showed forth among us in her words and deeds. And grant that we may have grace to live our lives in accordance with thy will, to seek the good of others, and to remain faithful servants unto our life's end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Confident in God's love and compassion, let us pray for all those whose hearts are heavy with grief and sorrow. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, deal graciously, we pray thee, with those who mourn, that casting every care on thee, they may know the consolation of thy love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. Let us pray for His Majesty the King and all the royal family, that they may know the sustaining power of God's love and the prayerful fellowship of God's people. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech Thee to bless our most gracious Sovereign Lord, King Charles, Camilla, the Queen Consort, William, Prince of Wales, and all the royal family. Endure them with thy Holy Spirit, enrich them with thy heavenly grace, prosper them with all happiness, and bring them to thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In recognition of Queen Elizabeth's service to this United Kingdom, let us rejoice in her unstinting devotion to duty, her compassion for her subjects, and her counsel to her ministers. And we pray for the continued health and prosperity of this nation. Almighty God, whose will it is that all thy children should serve thee in serving one another. Look with love, we pray thee, on this nation. Grant to its citizens grace to work together with honest and faithful hearts, each caring for the good of all, that seeking first thy kingdom and its righteousness, they may possess all things needful for their daily sustenance and the common good. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us give thanks for Queen Elizabeth's commitment to the Commonwealth throughout her reign, for her service and dedication to its people, and for the rich bonds of unity and mutual support she sustained. O almighty and everlasting God, hear our prayer for the Commonwealth and grant it the guidance of thy wisdom. Inspire those in authority that they may promote justice and the common good. Give to all its citizens the spirit of mutual honour and respect, and grant to us all grace to strive 
for the establishment of righteousness and peace, for the honour of thy name. Amen. We give thanks to God for Queen Elizabeth's loyalty to the faith she inherited through her baptism and confirmation and affirmed at her coronation, for her unswerving devotion to the gospel and for her steadfast service as Supreme Governor of the Church of England. Lord, we beseech thee to keep thy household, the Church, in continual godliness, that through thy protection she may be free from all adversities and devoutly given to serve thee in all good works, to the glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray that we may be given grace to live as those who believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to eternal life. Bring us, O Lord God, at our last awakening, into the house and gate of heaven, to enter into that gate and dwell in that house where there shall be no darkness nor dazzling, but one equal light, no noise nor silence, but one equal music, no fears nor hopes, but one equal possession, no ends nor beginnings, but one equal eternity. In the habitation of thy glory and dominion, world without end. In confidence and hope, let us pray to the Father in the words our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
let us commend to the mercy of God our Maker and Redeemer, the soul of Elizabeth, our late Queen. Heavenly Father, King of kings, Lord and giver of life, who of thy grace in creation didst form mankind in thine own image, and in thy great love offerest us life eternal in Christ Jesus, claiming the promises of thy most blessed Son, we entrust the soul of Elizabeth, our sister here departed, to thy merciful keeping, in sure and so certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, when Christ shall be all in all, who died and rose again to save us, and now liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit in glory for ever. Amen. Go forth, O Christian soul, from this world. In the name of God the Father Almighty, who created thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who suffered for thee. In the name of the Holy Spirit, who was poured out upon thee and anointed thee. In communion with all the blessed saints, and aided by the angels and archangels and all the armies of the heavenly host, may thy portion this day be in peace and thy dwelling in the heavenly Jerusalem. Amen.
God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the Church, the King, the Commonwealth, and all people, peace and concord, and to our sinners, life everlasting, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always.
It's Camilla Tomini, Associate Editor of the Daily Telegraph here, joined by military historian Christopher Joll and my colleague Gordon Rayner, Associate Editor of the Telegraph too. Um, moving, magisterial, mesmerizing, that service now as we see Queen Elizabeth II's coffin conveyed onto the gun carriage for the next processional part of this extraordinary day. Um, Christopher, your thoughts about that service? I think it was everything that the nation could expect. It was quiet, dignified, brief. It wasn't drawn out. Even the Archbishop of Canterbury kept his sermon quite short. And I think the precision with which everything has been done, not just by the military, but by all involved, has been deeply impressive, given they've only had, well, less than 10 days in reality to, to make it all happen. And Gordon, just explain what's happening next as we now are going to observe the Queen's coffin being conveyed <coughs> from here to Wellington Art. Well, uh, the rest of the day now moves towards Windsor, uh, where the Queen will uh, this evening be interred in the family vault. Um, we know that uh, the committal service in, in uh, St George's Chapel in Windsor will happen at four o'clock. That will be televised. Um, the, the interment will be private and we won't see that. So now uh, the uh, Queen's coffin is moving on the gun carriage uh, towards Wellington Arch, it's just about to move towards Wellington Arch. That'll take about um, 45 minutes and from Wellington Arch it will be placed in the state hearse to be driven uh, to Windsor for the second part of the, um, of the day's um, services. And we heard the bowl, uh, bell toll for um, the 96 years of the Queen's life there which was moving in the run up to this funeral. We're going to hear the guns firing every minute in Hyde Park by the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. And Big Ben again tolling throughout this procession, Christopher. Yes, and it's an extraordinary thing that the bell and the firing of the guns in Hyde Park is being absolutely coordinated. So they will happen at the same time, despite the fact they must be nearly a mile apart as the crow flies. Great piece of military planning and absolutely typical of the detail in which this whole ceremony has been put together. This scene is actually reminiscent of what happened on Wednesday where Her Majesty's coffin uh, was conveyed from Buckingham Palace having been flown in with the Princess Royal from Scotland to Westminster Hall. Um, there the members of the Royal Family walking in lockstep, the music again familiar Christopher as a funereal lament. Yes. Um, and as you say Gordon this takes some time now it's notable that in the Abbey, uh, Princess Charlotte and Prince George took part in that procession. Clearly the decision has been taken not to include them in this aspect. And indeed, the Duke of Kent due to walk in the procession, but perhaps considering his senior years, yeah. that's, you know, it's a 45 minute journey on foot. Yes, I think the, the Duke of Kent was, was only going to um, walk on, on the, the, down the nave, but I don't think we even saw him doing that, which I think was a sensible decision. Um, I think George and Charlotte, uh, this, is, this would be too much for them to, to expect them to take part in this, but they certainly um, played their part in mm. the ceremony immaculately. Um, and uh, Prince and Princess of Wales will be very pleased with the way that they've managed to cope with what has been the, the biggest, most important day of their lives, really. And a lovely combination that we witnessed there, um, Christopher, of royal formality, but also royal parenting. Yeah. Um, they were flanked by their parents. We had Charlotte wearing a beautiful black hat, so she had followed the dress code for all of the women in the Abbey. Uh, Prince George there, I mean, sometimes the order of service seemed almost bigger than him. <laughs> um, aged nine and seven, performing their duties already in it, this way. It was extraordinary. <clears throat> and actually rather moving. And of course, it's all about putting out the message of continuity. Um, interestingly, we're now seeing in front of us, as part of the parade, all kinds of officers of state and ceremonial officers who we don't normally see, like I can see, just gone out of shot, the Queen's barge master. Um, 
all turning up for these um, for, for this parade and putting themselves very much in the public eye. Well, the Queen's barge master will have a, a very important duty to perform later on at St George's Chapel because he is one of the people who will uh, take the uh, instruments of state from the coffin uh, and give them to the Dean of Windsor to put those at uh, the crown, the orb and the scepter uh, on the high altar. So we will see him uh, playing a very uh, prominent part later on today. Here, here comes the, um, the Royal Navy party that is drawing the coffin, just come into view. Um, flanked, as we've seen before, by the, the coffin itself, flanked by the Queen's former equerries, by a guard of honour from, I believe it's um, Queen's Company, uh, the Grenadier Guards, and on the outside, the gentleman at arms and the gentleman from the Company of Archers. So this is, if you wanted to encapsulate the panoply of the state of the Kingdom of, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Northern Ireland, there it is, right in front of you, right this moment, from the Imperial State Crown down to the last soldier on the parade. And presumably it was by design that the Queen wanted the Wednesday element to include mounted military and for this not. So we had the horse element on the Wednesday. Um, well, it is a parade on foot, but I think you will see that the Sovereign's Escort provided by the uh, House of Cavalry Mounted Regiment are indeed mounted. We haven't seen them yet, but they are part of the parade. So although um, King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery are not doing... Are. There's the Mounties. Uh, there are the Mounties cues, right yes. at the beginning. There are the Mounties at the head of the parade. In fact, that whole first section of the parade is Commonwealth. It's Commonwealth focused. So there are representatives from the, um, from the different realms of which the Queen is, was head of state. The Canadians, the New Zealanders, the Australians. And what a great sight to have the Mounties in the front. Mm. Indeed so, they look magnificent, don't they? Um, let's talk about the scene inside the Abbey. Um, you know, we had foreign royals uh, given very prominent seating, as would be expected, opposite the royal family. Um, we had the Duke of Sussex placed behind his father. We even had the Duchess of York, uh, you know, in a very prominent position with her daughters, Beatrice and Eugenie. Did anything? surprise you? We, we've reporting on the Telegraph website that Joe Biden was actually seated 14 rows back. What we've learned from this is royalty takes precedence even over the Commander-in-Chief. Yes, it was, um, I must say that seeing Sarah Duchess of York quite that prominently placed in the Abbey was a bit of a shock. Um, and also learning that Joe Biden was so far back in, in the seating, also a bit surprising. Um, what I thought was interesting was the perfect symmetry between the British royal family on one side of the nave and the foreign royal families all on the other side of the nave, incidentally all of whom are one way and another cousins of the late Queen. Every single one of, the, of those ruling heads. Gordon, there'll be a lot of interest in the flowers yeah. on the coffin as well as the note which mm. appeared to be handwritten by the King. Yes, we've seen the King's uh, handwriting uh, many times, haven't we, uh, when he's written letters to, uh, to ministers and he's put a note on there saying, uh, in loving and devoted memory, um, we can't quite see the bottom, but I imagine it just says Charles. Uh, it's on a black fringed card with Buckingham Palace on it. He, obviously, that is now his official home. Um, it's a different bouquet uh, from the one that we saw on the coffin during the Lying in State. It's colorful. Um, the colours of the flowers have been chosen to reflect the colours of the Royal Standard. Um, and a uh, huge amount of symbolism in that bouquet. It, it includes myrtle, which was grown from a sprig in the Queen's wedding bouquet in 1947. Uh, so that very much symbolising her, her 73-year marriage to Prince Philip. Uh, and then there are flowers and foliage that were cut from the gardens at Buckingham Palace, uh, at Clarence House, uh, and at the King's uh, personal residence, Highgrove House. And uh, as well as that myrtle, um, which is an ancient symbol of a, of a happy marriage, um, the wreath has got rosemary in it, which signifies uh, remembrance. 
Uh, it's got uh, oak, which symbolizes the strength of love. Um, and the scented flowers in the wreath, uh, we can see there pelagoniums, roses, hydrangea, sedum, dahlias, and scabious. Uh, and the, as I said there, the, the, the colors, gold, pink, and burgundy, a few touches of white, uh, reflecting the um, royal standard. And we're also told that uh, the king uh, insisted that the wreath has to be completely environmentally friendly. Um, it's made with uh, moss and oak branches to hold it together, so there's no foam or anything that, uh, that wouldn't um, decompose. You're watching The Telegraph live stream. It's me, Camilla Tomini, associate editor, joined by military historian Christopher Joll and my colleague Gordon Rayner. Uh, the procession there just entering Whitehall now. I can see Portcullis House in the background there. It's going to take another around 40 minutes to convey uh, Queen Elizabeth II to Wellington Arch, where she will then be transferred into a state hearse to make the remainder of the journey back to Windsor. That car is going to be driving at 12 miles an hour. And this is now the opportunity because actually um, Westminster has been sealed off this morning largely. The public couldn't really get to the Abbey or indeed the Hall. So this is now the moment that all of these people who have got up very, very early, some of them camped out overnight, not just last night, but for a couple of days, to see this spectacle, Christopher. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm relieved to see the first division of the Sovereign's Escort found by the Blues and Royals are indeed mounted. Um, that's a huge relief. Of course, when the uh, cortege gets to Horse Guards Arch and passes through it onto uh, Horse Guards Parade, the King's Lifeguard, as we must now call it, will of course turn out with its standard, um, which will be dipped as the late Queen's coffin goes past. And that will be repeated by the King's Guard, uh, for, found by the Foot Guards, um, up at Buckingham Palace, who will be on parade in the forecourt. So both ceremonial guards in London that mount every day um, and that tourists will be familiar with um, are indeed on parade again today paying their proper respects to the late Queen. When I was referring to Wednesday, what I meant is there might be some curiosity about having the carriage horse drawn on Wednesday. Oh, I see. But not today. <laughs> I, no. I, I appreciate that there were mounted um, cavalrymen here today, yeah. but it, I, it was just that distinction I thought was interesting, which would have been done with the late Queen say so, of course. Oh, yes, entirely. But I think what has happened is that since the, um, the problems with Queen Victoria's funeral procession, when the Navy had to step in and rescue the artillery, it has become a tradition. Right. Now, what is interesting is that the ceremonies that have gone, gone on in the past uh, 10 days are actually considerably more than the ceremonies for Queen Victoria when the tradition was first established. Because what happened with Queen Victoria was she was brought from Osborne where she died um, in the Royal Yacht Alberta, escorted by the home fleet to Portsmouth. She then went on a train to London, and the train was met by a cortege like this, and was then paraded across London um, to Paddington Station. So there was, in effect, only one parade for Queen Victoria in London, whereas we've seen at least two. Gordon, some people might be wondering why the royal women don't take part in this procession. Well, um, apart I, from sorry, apart from the Princess the Royal, Princess of course. Royal. Well, if they're not in uniform, they would be wearing, uh, for a start, in, for very practical reasons, uh, they would not be wearing footwear um, that would be uh, suitable for uh, marching. It's a very long way uh, that they're, that they're going to have to walk, and it's three quarters of an hour. Um, so unless um, they were wearing uh, footwear that is suitable for marching, um, it, I don't think it would work. Frankly. And they're going to be conveyed by car um, as part of this procession. Now, Christopher, I did notice when we were watching those um, scenes earlier, just before the service started at 11, you did wince a little bit when you saw that the Duke of Sussex wasn't allowed to take the salute or to give the salute. Just explain the significance of that, because we've, we've heard all the talk about him not being allowed to wear his uniform. What's your personal view as a military man on all of that? 
Are you inviting me to step into a major controversy? Just to express an honest opinion about it. All right, I'll give you a completely honest uh, view. I think it's a pity that um, Prince Harry has not been given the opportunity, except at the lying in state on the vigil of the princes, to wear, uh, to wear the uniform of his former regiment. I do think that's a pity. Um, I hope it's not going to be something that the new king later comes to regret um, when opinions are expressed about it. As a former officer, he is with the consent either of his commanding officer or his um, sovereign. He is permitted, to, all former officers are permitted to wear uniform once they've left the service, but it is strictly regulated on, and it's restricted to certain occasions. You couldn't, for example, wear, it, wear uniform to your wedding. Um, but state occasions are specifically included in dress regulations for the army, which govern these matters. And so, yes, I think in summary, I'd say as a former military man, that whatever Prince Harry has or has not done in terms of undermining the institution of which he, from which he draws his celebrity, uh, I still think it's a pity he wasn't in uniform. And the salute aspect? Well, you don't salute if you're not in uniform. And that's just... He, he looked uncomfortable in that moment, I thought. I thought he looked very uncomfortable, and if I'd been in his position, I would have been too. Um, other um, interesting figures we saw there, um, you spoke during the um, ceremony when we were off air about the uh, garter and thistle knights, who are extremely elaborately dressed. Um, just explain their significance and their presence in the Abbey today, Christopher. Um, I think it would have been a surprise if the Knights of the Order of the Garter and the Knights of the Order of Thistle had not been invited. They are the two most senior orders of chivalry in, in the United Kingdom. Their numbers are strictly limited, so you're not going to be getting hundreds of people coming in. And I thought it was very interesting, at least the ones that we saw, well, I think we saw two Garter Knights and two Knights of Thistle, wearing their full uh, robes of the order. Um, dark blue velvet in the case of the garter and dark green velvet in the case uh, of the thistle. Pretty good they look too. They did too. And um, there's, a, there's a link, isn't there, Gordon, to St George's Chapel when it comes to these orders of the chivalry? Yes, St George's Chapel is the, uh, is the base uh, for um, the, well, you put me on the spot here, I think it's the order of the garter. Yes. Yeah. That's what, why we see the garter ceremony at yes. St George's uh, every year up winter. And uh, somebody who was recently admitted to the Order of the Garter as, of course, the Queen Consort, Camilla. And that was seen as um, the late Queen sort of perhaps tying up a few loose ends and making sure that the King's wife was fully included. And that came a few months uh, last year before she announced in February that she would like the nation to embrace Camilla as Queen Consort. Um, which perhaps bearing in mind what you were saying earlier on in the live stream about the planning around her being in Balmoral in her twilight years, it did seem as if she wanted to get everything in order for this to be as smooth as transition as possible. Well, this is the moment that those waiting in the Mall have been waiting for um, to see this procession in front of them. Uh, it does take your breath away to see it in the flesh. We're just seeing some of the Royal ladies here, that's the Countess of Wessex, Sophia, she's colloquially known, sitting next to Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. There, um, we saw uh, the Princess of Wales accompany her children, Prince George and Princess Charlotte, along with the Queen Consort, who we've just been speaking about. Um, there's still a long day ahead, Gordon. Yeah. Um, this is only the London aspect of this ceremony. Yeah. The Queen uh, feeling it was very important to have the ceremony, of course, in the capital. Uh, the Buckingham Palace is the seat of our monarchy, isn't it? It's what she affectionately referred to as the office. Mm. Windsor's her home, though, Gordon. Yeah, although we talk about the funeral being, um, the service being here. Christopher was um, informing me earlier, weren't you, Christopher, about the Westminster Abbey is not normally where all funerals have taken place in the past. and. Normally they've been at, at Windsor, the whole thing's been at Windsor, and the, the procession in London is only really 
is just that, a procession, isn't it? Yeah, and then the coffin in the past has been taken to Paddington Station, yeah. put on a train to Windsor, and that's where all of the yes. uh, religious part of the um, ceremony happens. So this has been, this has been quite unusual. Um, yeah, the, the, in the past, the, the purpose of the processions in London had been to get the coffin into the lying in state and out of the lying in state, yeah. but there have been no religious ceremonies since, I believe, Gordon, do you check it up, since George II? That's what you told me, and I wouldn't doubt your, um, your <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> Fascinating to see the Metropolitan Police leading this whole thing on their horses because you, you think <coughs> about the military uh, practicing for these things and they take part in Trooping the Colour, that they, you know, that their horses are trained to do this. I'm, I'm not aware that the Metropolitan Police horses will have very often had a chance to, to take part in something like this or to practice for it. So big responsibility for them today, but a huge honour. And for their new boss, Mark Rowley, who's Absolutely. only new in the role, as was Liz Truss, yeah. I thought spoke well um, in the Abbey there, uh, Christopher. I did too. Um... Safe pair of hands, solid. I... Not necessarily charismatic, but solid. Yes, I think we've had enough of charisma for the, for the time <laughs> being. I think what we want now, I'm being very political, uh, I think we want some solid government now. Yes. Get us through the present mess in which we find ourselves. Indeed. And um, other people will be interested. In fact, my brother um, just messaged me from Brisbane saying, is, is, is no member of the royal family going to speak, Gordon? And the royals don't do eulogies. No. No, no, they don't. Uh, we they leave that to uh, the um, to the ministers. So we have the, they have a sermon. Uh, we have the sermon from the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, eulogies are not considered the, the done thing for uh, royal funerals. We didn't have one at Prince Philip's funeral. Uh, we won't have one today. Um, they are very much um, part of the ceremonial aspect, and they are the, they are the mourners. Um, they are not the people who uh, who speak. And actually, the royals have all communicated extremely movingly and touchingly about how they felt about Queen Elizabeth in their own personal tributes, which have yeah. been released throughout the course of this week. And they, they, they do a lot of their communicating through symbolism, as, we, as we've seen, as we were just talking about the, the wreath on the, uh, on yes. the coffin. That, that was full of symbolism, full of um, messages, uh, just in the, and you know, it, goes, it goes beyond just that. Well, let's talk about another symbol because the Princess of Wales was wearing a, um, a beautiful necklace, mm. um, which we understand again was a gift from the Queen. I mean, yes. it's uh, the Duchess of Sussex as well, wearing some pearl and diamond earrings that had been given to her by Queen Elizabeth when they undertook their first solo engagement together in Chester, mm. uh, just a month or so after um, Meghan married Harry in May 2018. Um, Kate's piece of jewellery, though, Apparently she wore it to the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral and uh, to the Queen and Prince Philip's 70th wedding anniversary. Yes. And uh, sometimes I think people look on the website and think, are you doing a whole story about the jewellery? But mm. um, you've done a lot of work on the crowns, um, Gordon. Yeah. Um, some of this jewellery is uh, well, sort of beyond measure, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, let's talk about the, the, the Imperial State Crown, which um, we have seen on the coffin for the past week. It's something which we're used to seeing uh, on state occasions like the state opening of Parliament, um, but it's a fascinating object in itself. It was um, it was made for Charles II. Um, most of the crown jewels date from around that time because obviously Cromwell um, destroyed the previous uh, crown jewels. Uh, it's not the it's not the crown that the Queen or indeed the new King will be crowned without the coronation. That is the St Edward's crown, which is only ever used. Uh, at the coronation itself, but the yeah, the imperial state crown, it's, it's been, it, it's a version of the crown that was made for Charles II, it's been remade about ten times, uh, and it contains of course the, um, the Cullinan, Cullinan II, the second largest cut diamond in the uh, crown jewels, the Cullinan I is in the scepter, the largest cut diamond in the world. Um, we were talking just before about how those two enormous diamonds can be detached and worn together as a brooch, uh, although we think the last person to do that was Queen Mary. Um, there are um, about 3,000 diamonds altogether in that imperial state crown. Um, and then the orb, which again we only see um, on occasions like this, uh, is that represents uh, Christ's um, power over the earth and the fact that the monarch is Christ's 
local representative on Earth, as it were, because it's a, cry, it's a cross over a globe and um, it's divided into three sections because at the time it was made, um, they, people thought there were only three continents. So that, that's why you've got the, the band around the middle and the loop over the top. And the scepter? Uh, the scepter represents equity, uh, so it's, uh, it's a symbol of um, sort of equity and mercy. So it's the, uh, the monarchs, uh, you know, you've, you've got the, the crown which represents their um, status over their subjects. You've got the orb which represents their, the religious part, they're representing, the, you know, um, Christ. And then you've got the scepter which is, represents their, um, like I say, their the sort of qualities of mercy and equality, equanimity. And was it you, Gordon, I think, who was telling me that there was an incident with the crown? Was there it was. at George VI's funeral or fifth? George V, yes, the, uh, the imperial state crown, the same crown we're seeing today, um, as it was brought into Westminster Hall for the lying in state, uh, the top of it, the, uh, the cross, um, fell off um, and it was picked up by um, a guardsman who put it in his pocket and obviously reaffixed later on. Um, Edward VIII uh, uh, is said to have seen that happen and said, that's not a very good omen. Uh, and he turned out to be right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Christopher, correct me if I'm wrong, but we understand from the briefing that the crown jeweller will come along to uh, Windsor and will take the crown, the orb and the scepter away. Yes. And then as Gordon's pointed out, it's going to be a different crown at the coronation, the taller um, St Edward's crown. But what happens to the orb and scepter then? We're not going to see them again until the coronation? Uh, no, I don't think we will. They'll go back to the Jewel House at the Shire of London. In fact, all the royal regalia will. Um, if there is a state opening of Parliament between now and the next coronation, um, I'm guessing, I don't know the full answer to this, but I'm guessing that the Crown will be carried on a cushion and not worn. Gordon, well, Gordon do you I, know I the was, answer to that? Well, all I was going to say was that the one thing that we know will happen is that it will have to go to the Crown Jeweller to be resized because yeah. um, it was resized for the Queen um, and it won't fit on uh, the King's head, it'll be too small. Uh, and they don't just um, pack it with extra ermine or, or, um, or velvet, they do resize the actual metal. So someone will have, well the Crown Jeweller, will have the job of cutting that, that band, splicing a bit of extra metal and perhaps a few more um, jewels into it to make it fit the King's head. You're listening to Camilla Tomini, Gordon Rayner and military historian Christopher Joll on this live stream as we watch this procession continue towards Wellington Arch. It's quarter to one now so we expect it to arrive there at Wellington Arch on where the bearer party will place the coffin on the state hearse for the journey to Windsor. Um, as the hearse departs the national anthem will play and um, there will be people lining this route um, from here to Windsor. We have got it on the Telegraph website if you want to have a look at it because obviously that's an opportunity for people who haven't made it to London, haven't made it to Scotland, didn't want to face the crowds to possibly get a view of it, Gordon, on the, um, will it be on the A, a I'm thinking a through Chiswick and then a on the A4. T, I believe, goes to J and then, yeah. yes, I think the A4. And the A30. I was going to say, just when we were talking about this, the crown there, we saw a shot of the, uh, the drum horse Apollo who is um, a very big horse, 17 hands tall. Uh, and um, I'm fascinated by the fact that uh, ho uh, animals in the, uh, in the armed forces have ranks, which Christopher and I were talking about earlier on. And the, the drum horse uh, has the rank of major and is the most senior animal in the army. Um, Christopher knows all about this. And mm -hmm. we were talking about the Welsh Guards dog is a guardsman and uh, there are ponies which have other ranks as well, aren't there? Well, there's, the Irish Guards have got a wolfhound, um, the predecessor of which in the 30s very nearly caused a diplomatic incident when on exercise in Hyde Park he killed the greyhound belonging to the Italian ambassador. <laughs> My um, goodness me. But yes, there are animals throughout the army. Some indeed have ranks. Those that are, are deemed to be mascots have ranks. Uh, the drum horse, there are actually three drum horses in the House of Cavalry, but the one on parade today is uh, that of the Blues and Royals, carrying the magnificent silver kettle drums presented to them by King George III. Incidentally, their predecessor regiment, the Royal Horse Guards, was King George III's favourite regiment, and he based the so-called Windsor Dress, which is still worn today, 
on their uniform. Um, one other uh, regimental mascot worth remembering, because they're on parade today, the Royal Regiment of Scotland, their mascot is called Corporal Crocken, and he's a Shetland pony. And the, cur the current corporal is notorious for every time you met the Queen trying to either nibble her fingers or eat her bouquet. Mm. <laughs> I, uh, I was also reading that the, the drum horses belong to the sovereign, and that means that their manes and tails can't be clipped without the express permission of the sovereign. So there are a lot of, lot of jobs that the sovereign has to do yes. that you don't think of, aren't there? Imagine having to. I'm, I'm ask sure the sovereign she must have delegated do, those powers. You would hope. Um, so we've talked about the state gun courage and households, we've talked about the Royal Navy and Royal Marines involvement, we've also talked about the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Air Force and civilian services. Let's talk about the George Cross foundations and armed forces of the Commonwealth contribution to this. I mean the decision to include George Cross holders in the ceremony and indeed this, I, um, I mean it's obviously in tribute to the importance of this hugely significant military honour. Well, what I think we're seeing, Camilla, as the parade goes past us, is a snapshot of the Queen as sovereign and in her role with the armed forces. So you see military contingents from the Commonwealth countries. You see the Victoria Cross and the George Cross associations, including current holders of those extraordinary um, decorations for valour, which are made, the recommendation is made to the Queen, but the decision was taken by her. And then following on behind, there is really representatives of every element of the Queen's involvement with the services. I was sorry, I was just going to add on the, on the George Cross uh, point that one of the um, inclusions in this procession has been uh, representatives of the collective recipients of the George Cross. So we've got people from Malta, which was awarded the George Cross for its courage during the war. Uh, we've got NHS workers. The NHS was given the George Cross um, during after the COVID. Uh, and we've got representatives of the Police Service of Northern Ireland, which was given the George Cross when it was still the RUC. So there are doctors and nurses in this parade. I'm not sure that we've really seen them no, yet. No, we haven't yet, there. have we? They're, they're right at the very head of the procession. Well, that's what we were told. Uh, yeah. Just behind the mountains. Yeah. Um, the cameras that we're looking at at the moment are currently focused on the Mall, where we've got Band of the Irish Guards marching past, um, followed by a detachment of the infantry regiments, of which the infantry regiments of the line, of which the Queen was Colonel-in-Chief, followed by various cavalry regiments, of which she was Colonel-in-Chief. So, I come back to the point I was making a minute ago, this is a truly representative parade and the, the soldiers on it will be will feel themselves to be incredibly privileged. Mm. I mean this is the kind of thing that you take part in and you remember for life and you tell children and grandchildren yeah. and if you're lucky enough to have them great-grandchildren Christopher um, I mean presumably in your military life you've had colleagues who have been present at some of these events and it must have a profound effect on people. I, I refer back to the pallbearers for instance. Yeah. I mean that's a life-changing moment to take part in, isn't it? Yes, and interestingly, um, a friend of mine in London who comes from a very, very long line of lifeguards has her grandfather's albums and he had the privilege of commanding the lifeguards at both the, uh, the, Ju the Silver Jubilee of George V, the funeral of George V and the coronation of George VI. And these photograph albums are absolutely remarkable. And needless to say, she's extremely proud of her grandfather just for that, let alone anything else. There can't be many officers who can say that they've done um, a jubilee, a coronation and a state funeral, although I suspect that by the end of next year, there'll be one or two officers that we see on the parade today, and indeed soldiers, who will be able to make that claim. And um, I suppose the other thing, sort of watching this scene is it can't be lost on anyone, despite the sad circumstances, that this was exactly the sort of event that Queen Elizabeth used to love. Pomp and pageantry, to inspect the troops, to have a very keen eye for detail, Christopher. So one understands, and it was always said of the late Queen in the Brigade of Guards, and in, well, in the Household Division, of which I was a part, 
um, that she could spot an upside down button at 100 paces. Mm -hmm. And it's a little known fact, but at the end of every Queen's birthday parade, through her private secretary, she would pass notes back to the General Officer Commanding London District and the Household Division, chap otherwise known as the Major General, who is on this parade in his feathered cocked hat. Notes would go back to him and they'd be both um, commendations and criticisms. Yeah, um, Prince, uh, Prince William, the, the Prince of Wales, um, and the Princess of Wales visited uh, Purbright uh, in Surrey at the weekend to uh, meet some of the soldiers who were preparing to take part in this and he was saying to them uh, about uh, how much interest the Queen would have shown in, in the whole procession and he said she would have been interested in uh, the procession, the uniforms, how everyone was turned out. Um, certainly wasn't um, lessening the pressure on them I don't think by, by telling mm. them that. Mm. No. I mean, it was interesting during COVID that when everything was scaled down, she did insist on having that mini troop in the colour at Windsor. Yeah. Um, it was the one date in the diary that was sacrosanct. Mm. Um, Although interesting, you know, do you know the origins of that parade? Can no, I? please tell us. It's the foot guard's birthday present to the sovereign. It's not the other way around. Mm. Um, they paraded to honour the, the foot guards paraded to honour the sovereign. And indeed, the presence of the Household Cavalry and more recently, King Street Royal Horse Artillery are later additions. It's, um, as my foot guard friends will tell me, it's a foot guards parade, first and foremost, wishing the then sovereign a happy birthday. What's the biggest fear here um, for these military personnel taking part in this? Um, not being in step? Yes. God forbid, God forbid. keeling over? I think it's unlikely that anyone will keel over um, whilst they're marching. Mm. The, the reason you keel over is because you stand too long in one place and pressure on the heel affects your, um, your brain and over you go. Marching isn't a problem. You very, very rarely see people keel over. Uh, of course, for the House of Cavalry, that's a different story altogether because they're sitting in the saddle and the danger is that some idiot runs out of the crowd and frightens your horse and off yeah. you come. Yes. Um, we, we do say, well, I, when we were talking earlier about Trooping the Colour, that there was a very dramatic moment when uh, I was standing in horse guards for Trooping the Colour earlier this year and uh, there was a, a horse that threw its rider and then was a, a loose horse running through horse guards very, yep. very, very close to where the, the now king was, uh, was sitting on his horse together with the Princess Royal uh, and the Prince of Wales. And um, that was, that was uh, I, mean, I was very fortunate nothing worse happened, but having a, a loose horse careering through horse guards in the middle of that parade was um, not, uh, not planned. And I can, I can add to that. Do you, mm. want a, do you want a little coda to that story? Always. Um, the, tr the, the soldier concerned managed to get back up. He remounted, yeah. but in four, when the horse fell, he grazed himself very badly and was streaming yeah. with blood. Yeah. And so was taken off the parade because it was thought that wouldn't look very good on mm. TV, as indeed it wouldn't have done. But the um, horse must have got away because it was... It, was, it did, but horses are herd animals, so it went yeah. in a big circle and yeah. came and rejoined its mates. Right. Um, it wouldn't have bolted for the wild blue yonder. No. Um, is the king going to have the same fascination and fondness for this sort of pomp and pageantry? And does it make a difference? I suppose the legacy of the Royal Family's association with the military has been passed on through William and indeed Harry's yeah. two tours of Afghanistan. Oh, I, I think unquestionably, we have to remember that, that they've all served in the armed forces. The Queen herself was um, joined the Auxiliary, Auxiliary Territorial Service in 1945 when she was 18, as, as we know. Um, uh, the Prince of uh, the, the King, as he is now, um, was in the Royal Navy uh, and uh, he served on, I believe it was a minesweeper, is that right, Christopher? Yes, He served correct. on a minesweeper. Uh, then, as you said, um, his two sons, um, the Prince of Wales, um, flew with the RAF, he, he was a Coast Guard, and of course Prince Harry um, served two tours of Afghanistan flying Apache helicopters. So they, the, the, the armed forces um, run through their veins and uh, I think uh, the King will be every bit as um, keen on um, keeping up that uh, very, very close link um, as, uh, as any other monarch has been. Well, it's coming up to five to one where uh, we expect the arrival of 
Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II's coffin at Wellington Arch after this extremely moving and, well, spectacular parade. Um, concluding thoughts, really, Christopher, about what we've witnessed, not just today, uh, but since last Thursday when we heard the terrible news of the Queen's death. I think we've seen the very best of British pomp and pageantry. Um, I said earlier that I think we do it better than anybody else in the world, and I said why. And I think this last 10 days has demonstrated that um, in a way that no number of words could do. You've just got to look at it. And Gordon, we've also seen the best of the royal family this week, haven't we? Yes, I think so. And it's, we've seen an extraordinary response from the public. Um, we, uh, you know, let's not forget this was a, um, a 96 year old uh, woman who um, had, you know, lived a, a very long life. Um, her, her death wasn't a, an enormous surprise. Um, so what we're seeing here is not, not so much the, the outpouring of grief and shock that we saw when, when Diana, Princess of Wales died. What we're seeing is huge respect, huge, um, a huge thank you really from the British public for uh, the fact that she gave her entire life in service. She was still working for her country until two days before she died. Um, and that, that means an awful lot to people. A one in a million event for a one in a million monarch. Thank you so much for joining us today on this Telegraph live stream. It will continue without our commentary. Gordon and I have to write. Christopher's no doubt going to be helping us with some of the finer detail that we need for our copy. You can, of course, continue to watch this live stream. Please continue to look at the Telegraph live blog, which will give you every detail of what's happening now over the course of the next hours and into this week. Um, and thank you for your company today. Thank you for reading the Telegraph. We'll be here with you every step of the way. But for now, we're going to leave you with these remarkable and poignant scenes as we prepare to bid a final farewell to Queen Elizabeth II. Thank you for joining us.
party will remove headdress. Remove headdress.
left the provisions. Thank you, bro. Can you all back up?
Thanks, Pete. Um, the current location, are they coming down uh, south on that street?
Yeah, copy that, Pete. I think we'll get there.
o'clock to the tees. We're coming close to our end shot. Uh, we'll be coming up when they go on the roundabout to a wide, and then we're going to show uh, Windsor Castle in the distance.
Sorry, sorry, mate. There you are, yeah? Who? Phil. Phil. Yeah. Phil. Yeah. Phil. still haven't come up the hill yet. No, no, no. Yet. Oh, they've not gone through the gates yet. No. no.
Molly. 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 Sei passaggio. I bet you're panning around, I can't, I can't see them. You're in my way. Well, I'm going to see around that tree, you see.
Okay. All right now. Cool. Can you see the holes? I can feel that. You can't really see the hearse, can you?
Just now on the hill, you should get it. Has it, has it gone in? Not yet. No, it's in, it's in. It's in. It's the finish. No, they're still marching in, but the horse is in. It's hard to pass. I can't see the horse. Are you, are you, are you filming in? Is there? Oh, it's a fan. Well, what if it's really small? Yes. No, it's still outside, sorry. Yeah, it is still outside, yes.
we have come together to commit into the hands of God the soul of his servant Queen Elizabeth. Here in St George's Chapel, where she so often worshipped, we are bound to call to mind someone whose uncomplicated yet profound Christian faith bore so much fruit. Fruit in a life of unstinting service to the nation, the commonwealth and the wider world, but also and especially to be remembered in this place in kindness, concern and reassuring care for her family and friends and neighbours. In the midst of our rapidly changing and frequently troubled world, her calm and dignified presence has given us confidence to face the future as she did with courage and with hope. As with grateful hearts we reflect on these and all the many other ways in which her long life has been a blessing to us, we pray that God will give us grace to honour her memory by following her example and that with our sister Elizabeth at the last we shall know the joys of life eternal. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. 
And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Remember, O Lord, thy servant Elizabeth, who has gone before us with the sign of faith, and now rests in sleep. According to thy promises, grant unto her and to all who repose in Christ refreshment, light, and peace through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Merciful Father and Lord of all life, we praise thee that thou hast made us in thine image and that we reflect thy truth and light. We give special thanks for the life of thy daughter Elizabeth, for the mercy she received from thee and for the example that through her life of service, love and faith, she has set before our eyes. Above all, we rejoice at thy gracious promise to all thy servants, living and departed, that we shall rise again at the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We pray that in due time we may share with our sister that clearer vision when we shall see thy face in the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Father of all, we pray to thee for those whom we love but see no longer. Grant them peace, let light perpetual shine upon them, and in thy loving wisdom and almighty power, work in them the good purposes of thy perfect will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, support us all the day long of this troublous life, until the shades lengthen and the evening comes, the busy world is hushed, and the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then, Lord, in thy mercy, grant us safe lodging, a holy rest and peace at the last, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord God Almighty, King of creation, bless our King and all members of the royal family. May godliness be their guidance, may sanctity be their strength, may peace on earth be the fruit of their labours, and their joy in heaven, thine eternal gift. 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God save our gracious Sovereign and all the companions living and departed of the most honourable and noble order of the Garter. Amen. As our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
Like as a father pitieth his own children, even so is the Lord merciful unto them that fear him. For he knoweth whereof we are made, he remembereth that we are but dust. The days of man are but as grass, for he flourisheth as a flower of the field. For as soon as the wind goeth over it, it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endureth for ever and ever upon them that fear him, and his righteousness upon children's children. Go forth upon thy journey from this world, O Christian soul, in the name of God the Father Almighty, who created thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, who suffered for thee, in the name of the Holy Spirit, who strengtheneth thee, in communion with the blessed saints, and aided by angels and archangels, and all the armies of the heavenly host. May thy portion this day be in peace and thy dwelling in the heavenly Jerusalem. Amen. Thus, it hath pleased Almighty God to take out of this transitory life unto his divine mercy, the late, most high, most mighty, and most excellent monarch, Elizabeth II. By the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of her other realms and territories, Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, and Sovereign of the Most Noble Order of the Garter. Let us humbly beseech Almighty God to bless with long life, health and honour and all worldly happiness the Most High, Most Mighty and Most Excellent Monarch, our Sovereign Lord, Charles III, now by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and of his other realms and territories, King, Head of the Commonwealth, 
defender of the faith and sovereign of the most noble order of the Garter. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour all people. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.
and you get a real sense, I think, 